I'm Liz. I own uh, Dirty Dog Inc. in Saratoga. Um, we used to be Dirty Dog by Liz, but now we go by Dirty Dog Inc. Um, I've been a groomer for about 12 years. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so Liz is a, Liz is some, for those of you listening and watching, Liz is somebody that I trust, I've trusted with my dogs. And actually, Taylor, I didn't tell you this, but when Liz came in, she saw the picture of Thompson. It's like so sad. crying. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, don't. I was like, you're gonna come out back and see a huge mural of him. Oh so. my gosh! Anyway, I so I've obviously trusted Liz with my personal dogs and still do with the one dog I have left. Um, uh, but really quick, I want to stop you there. Why did you switch from like Dirty Dog by Liz to Dirty Dog Inc.? Like, where was? Because I noticed I didn't know that until I came in the other day, and yeah. I was like, oh, I saw a new logo. I saw the new mm -hmm. thing. So what was that? So we're kind of going through like a little rebranding right now. Um, and I have other staff that are excellent. And so I wanted to get away from it being mm. by Liz. Because um, then everybody thinks when they call, when they text, they're always talking to me. I'm the only one grooming their dogs. And, you know, I just have, I have a great team. So I wanted it to be, you know, yeah. all inclusive of my whole staff instead of like, hey, look at me. <laughs> no, that makes sense. Yeah. I was curious about that. Yeah, the new logo looks sweet. The old logo was yeah. cool, too. Yeah. But the new logo looks sweet. I the new that. logo is custom designed. Um, my friend, uh, Mark Jewell, and an old client of mine, I groomed his dog, Evil Knievel, for years until she passed. Um, he actually designed it, so it's all custom drawing and whatnot. So, mm. yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I like it. So, you've been doing it for 12 years. Obviously, like, I'm assuming, like a lot of other people who work with dogs, you started off a dog lover from mm -hmm. day one. And then, so what was the, what was the decision that made you or encouraged you or inspired you to go into grooming? Because the dog world is a big yeah. place and obviously you have a big place in your heart for animals, mm -hmm. specifically dogs. So at what point in your life were you like, grooming is what you want to do? Um, I... Like, I, I wasn't one of those ones that grew up, like, I want to work with animals. or I mean, I've always loved animals, but it was never like, a, I'm going to be a dog groomer, I'm going to be a veterinarian, I'm, you know. I never knew what I wanted to do I, until I was, like, in my 30s. And then I did so many jobs that I knew I didn't want to do. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to try, you know, I love animals, I have four dogs of my own, like, I, you know... I would love to work in a vet office or at a shelter or something like that. So let's try here. Um, and I got a job bathing um, at a dog grooming shop. And it was just part time. And it was within like a month. I was like, this is what I want to do. Like, it's so much more than just, you know, bathing a dog or giving a dog a haircut. There's so many levels to dog grooming. Um, and it just instantly became my passion. Like, I've never been passionate about a career. I never held a job for more than two years before mm -hmm. I found dog grooming. So being in the same industry for 12 years and pretty much in the same location for all of that time, you know, it's just, it really just became a passion for me at that point in time. So it was the, uh, you worked at the, the, you were, you were just bathing at a grooming shop mm -hmm. and then you really liked that. And then that's where you went all in. Yep. Yeah. And then I, that's, I apprenticed under a groomer, you know, she trained me, um, and yeah, the rest is pretty much history. Mm. You know, went to a couple conventions and I just got back from a convention. Um, so always continuing education. There's always something new to learn. I'm not like a master groomer by any means. Like you see some beautiful, like you go to a competition and you see these like Bichons and poodles and all this fancy stuff. And, and I'm much more of like a um, St. Bernard and mm -hmm. <laughs> Newfoundland and elderly dogs and you know dogs that have health challenges and things like that so that's kind of where I found my passion mm. um yeah and behavioral stuff too right yes yeah some behavioral stuff um I've kind of I've been a little more selective about like behavioral cases um more or less because I'm getting old <laughs> and tired um so as long as I have an owner that understands their dog so, like, basically, if you send me somebody that you've been working with, I will take them because it's somebody that wants to see their dog succeed, mm -hmm. that is willing to put in the effort um, for training, whether it's, you know, having a, a professional trainer, doing the training at home, doing the training that I recommend for what I need to get done. And they also understand their dog's personality and their dog's challenges. 
Um, if I get a dog that comes in that has, you know, certain behavioral challenges and the parents are just like, oh, yeah, he might nibble on you. It's just his way of telling you he loves you. That's not, you know, I'm not willing to risk um, ending my career over an injury if, you know, people don't understand their own dog. Yeah. So you need to understand your own dog, um, which you, you know, yeah. you get that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and just a little context, I guess, for people who are listening and watching because people are viewing this and listening to this from all over the world. Uh, Liz um, works where I'm from, so we've known each other now for a long time, and when we're referring to referring cases to you like I do that often even Abby our videographer behind the camera she has a German Shepherd that can she's vocal mm -hmm. and she's a little stranger dangery but I don't think she would ever bite anybody but like when Abby has her here or whatever Abby's like pulling hair off I'm like you gotta go see <laughs> yes. this and she's like she, yeah but like I'm like but there's certain people in the industry that I know, well, because there's twofold with you, is you're good with the behavioral cases, but you're also, like, a, just a really good groomer. I've used other groomers before, and they're okay, but, like, you have the whole package where you oh, can you. do both. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's difficult because as a somebody who works with behavior on a regular basis, right, you have a much harder job than I would regarding dog behavior yeah. because I just have to get the dog to coexist in public. Mm -hmm. No barking, growling. But I'm, I, I've started to kind of coin the type of training that I do, like lifestyle training. It's not obedience. It's, it's behavioral, but it's yeah. really lifestyle. Somebody, like an average everyday person, pet owner, has a dog with a problem, and they're like, I just want to be able to have my friends over. Right. I just want to be able to walk my dog on the weekends with my friends or my family or whatever. That's all the training I do. I, I very rarely will work with a specialty ask or a specialty request of competitive obedience or any any other type of like niche thing of like mm -hmm. somebody who's doing a like or hunting or things like that retrieval training like I don't do that I I'm a lifestyle trainer where I'll help dog owners live a better life with their dog mm -hmm. so with you you have to like not only uh you have to like physically handle these dogs yeah so were you so were you were you always comfortable with the behavioral stuff or were you just like I can do it I mean I, I yeah I've always been fairly comfortable with it um I've just I've grown in my own confidence and also my own ability to say no um so I know my own personal limits um and I've gotten better at understanding and recognizing a dog's limits as well. So, you know, a lot of times you find younger groomers, um, ones that are new into the industry, um, that they have this pride thing, like, oh, well, no one else can do it, I can do it. And I definitely had that mentality when I was younger. Um, and I never, I, I won't say I've never been bitten, I have, you know, a couple times. I've never been seriously injured by a dog because even in my, like, overzealousness when I was a young groomer, I still knew when to stop. Um, and I think that's an important thing. I mean, you'll see stuff, videos um, on YouTube and Facebook that get circulated of dogs that are, you know, hooked up and they're just going crazy. And, you know, these owners are, or these groomers are pushing them through these things. Um, and I think a really important thing for people to learn in the industry is when to stop when to take a step back, when to like set your pride aside and realize like what you're doing for this dog isn't maybe the right approach for that mm. dog. And that's a hard thing, you know, because anybody in any profession, like you never want to feel like you can't accomplish something or that you can't finish something. Um, and I learned, I heard a phrase at a grooming convention last year that was there is a groomer out there for every dog. So anytime you have a dog in your care that you're not making progress with, you're not clicking with, you're not able to establish a relationship or trust with, and you keep trying to force that relationship with that dog, you are preventing that dog and that owner from finding the groomer that's right for them. Mm. Hmm. So that's where my shift in like just taking on all the behavioral cases has changed. If I can, you know, within a couple of visits, start to see um, some progress in my relationship with a dog, if the owner is willing to work, do desensitization work, that's huge in our industry is just 
desensitizing dogs to things like nail clippers, trimmers, um, the blow dryer, getting in and off the table, in and out of the shop even. So when owners are willing to work with me on that, and I can start to see a little bit of progress, I can start to gain some trust with the dog, then I am more than happy to proceed. If I'm not seeing that, then I'm not doing that dog or that owner any favors by trying to continue to force that relationship. So that's where it's really important. I'm, me and a, a few of the other groomers in the area are trying to start networking more with other groomers so that we can know each other's strengths. So when I get a dog and then I'm like, I am just not connecting with this owner, I'm not connecting with this dog, I have somebody that I can refer them to that I trust. Um, so we're, there's a few of us that have been kind of like, what's the word I'm looking for? I want to say coagulating. <laughs> That's not the right word. Yeah, just working, um, working. Yeah, together. trying to work together to kind of create a network, you know, so that we can share clients with each other. Because really, ultimately, we're all here for the dogs. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm always going to put the dog's needs first. And if that means I'm not the right groomer for your dog, then I'm not. If that means the haircut that you are asking me to do isn't an appropriate haircut for your dog, then I'm not going to do it. If that means you want to get your dog groomed every three months, but you really need to get your dog groomed every four weeks, then that's going to be a requirement. So it's ultimately always putting the dog's needs first. That's huge. Mm -hmm. That's really cool because you're, because there's, I always tell people there is no competition, unless you're in competition, there right. is no competition. Exactly. Right? Because there's 10 times the amount of dogs out there. <laughs> then, you know, that there's never really competition with business per se, mm -hmm. especially I think if you're good at what you do in the dog space, because if you're good at what you do and it doesn't matter if you're a vet, dog walker, groomer, trainer, whatever, you're going to have a wait, you're always going to have a wait list and you're always going to have work because and it's just like anything. Like if you're the best pizza shop in town, there's, t I mean, th think about that. How many other restaurants? It's like, anyway. Yeah. So that's good that you guys are networking because- that is so big for you. It's it's good to see because that means you guys will ultimately all be this one power force. Yeah. You're like, you know what? This isn't, or just like your schedule. If you're like, I can't take anything else, you can go to somebody else. And, and that way, everybody wins mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, you're like, man, this dog is a mess. But you're like, I, my schedule is booked or whatever. You can say, hey, I'm going to refer you to our our community of other dog groomers in the area that I know that I trust with you and your dog, which is huge. Cause that does at the end of the day, solve a solution. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, there was many years of like very like cutthroat, you know, the grooming industry was very cutthroat. It was like, you know, everybody, it was, I mean, not so much in our area, thankfully, at least I kind of came into the industry at a big transitional time. Um, you know, it used to be a lot more, um, there's a lot more gentle grooming involved now. There's a lot more community involved where, you know, it used to be a whole nother ball game. Um, but, you know, it's, it's nice now to have that. Yeah. Just to have that community. Is there, so when you are hitting on that whole other ball game type thing, I always try to, I would assume, cause I talk to a lot of other dog people in my profession, you know, groomers, trainers, vets, whatever, um, I know that there's, it's easy for, for somebody like myself to be like, oh, it seems like the industry is so at, at war with each other sometimes and whatever. So do you see that too in the grooming community where it's very political and it's very, it's like, oh, if you train this way, yes, then this or interesting. Yeah. What is, so what are the different groups and sides of the grooming? Yeah, there, there, there's a lot of, um, I mean... Yes and no. So there, there's, there's definitely certain areas where there's like two very strong camps. Um, one big one that's always like an ongoing, you know, argument on like the Facebook groups and things like that is how to care for double coated dogs and triple coated dogs. Um, you know, do you shave them? Do you not shave them? You know, this whole thing. So that is a huge division. Um, a lot of like the fear free and that kind of stuff. There's a lot of different opinions on that. Um, I do know a couple of fear-free groomers in the area. I've done the fear-free training myself. I still implement a lot of what I learned in that training, but it doesn't work for every dog and it doesn't work in every salon. 
Um, so you see a lot of that, like, oh, well, that's a, you know, the use of muzzles or the use of a groomer's helper, which is um, just an extra attachment that keeps the dog from being able to bite you or spin around or, you know, choke themselves. Um, so, you know, the use of some of these more restraining methods, you know, it's like in your industry, oh, is it safe to use a prong collar? Is it safe to use an right. e-collar? Um, so, yeah, we have stuff like that. Um, but, yeah, I would say the big one is the, the double and triple coated care. Um, That's yeah, and just like the way that people handle customer service and things like that. So, yeah. But it's a lot of that has shifted in the last few years. Um, COVID was a huge, created a huge shift in our industry. Um, so that was, you know, we had, we went from having, I don't, I don't remember the number. I think it's like the number of dogs in our, in our country, like pets, mm. like more than doubled during COVID. And so many shops closed down and didn't make it. There was a, a massive retirement of groomers because they're like, you know what? I'm done. Like I've been doing this for 40 years. My back hurts. I have carpal tunnel. I'm, I'm going to retire. And we had multiple shops just in our area close. Um, so we had this huge influx of dogs, a decrease in groomers, and, you know, the way that groomers, uh, business owners run their shops is another, like, huge um, conflict, you know, of, of, like, camps or whatever and how that should be done. You know, it used to be, well, I won't, we don't have to get into all of that, but, you know, it's hard to find good help. It's hard to find groomers that, you know, nobody grooms or gets into dog grooming because they want to make a ton of money. Mm. You know, and that's not fair. Like, our job is very hard, and it's physically difficult. We go through a lot of training. We're constantly re-educating ourselves. It's, you know, mentally stressful, um, and it's, you know, it's a very rewarding job, obviously, but at, with any kind of rewarding thing, it comes a cost, you know? So um, I kind of, like, went off on a little rabbit trail there. No, it's um, good. But, yeah, so... I guess that those are, so the double coated and triple coated dog care, um, you know, the fear free versus more, you know, restraint, um, the actual operational, you know, business of running a grooming shop and how you handle your employees. You know, those are all like yeah. some pretty big ones. Yeah. It's interesting to hear all that just because it's like that in every, in every industry, mm -hmm. like pizza making, yeah. um, a plant grooming, like literally on every Every business, if, if there's going to be heart in something, mm -hmm. there's going to be an argument all the time, yeah. right? Like if you're, if it's something that you're passionate about and it's a service in particular, and then it's a service to animals, because obviously it's like that with the dog space too, where you have all these people that are like, no. And then all these other people are like, yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like it's, and then, and then the consumer, the dog owner is sitting there like, like what, well, what, well, what, well, and it's confusing for them ultimately, which is why I've dedicated pretty much my career now to just you know things like this education, yeah. being middle ground and fair and like you know trying to be diverse. But it's interesting that you say that there's so when you talk about like the fear-free type of training, mm -hmm. what is that? What does that mean in the grooming? space so the fear free is like a certification program uh, that's like nationally they have like a national database so trainers uh, veterinarians basically any like canine professional can go through this it's an all an online training and then you know you're fear free certified um, so a lot of it is like controlling your environment so having a quiet space one-on-one -on -one grooming um, you know those kind of things like how you know the sound is, the smells, um, that kind of thing. It's very minimal restraint, um, a lot of desensitization work, um, f like rewarding with treats and stuff like that. So when you have like a small space or you are capable of being a one-on-one -on -one groomer, it's, it's an excellent way to work with a lot of dogs. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have the ability to do that, like, in my space. And I also, like, a big thing on it is food rewards and treats. And we see so many dogs um, that have so many different allergies and things like that, so we don't carry any treats in our shop. If you want to give your dog a treat, if you want us to use treats, you know, we request that you bring them from home. So, I mean, the fear-free thing is a great approach for a certain type of dog, mm -hmm. 
you know, and then, you know, not all dogs respond well to that very gentle, very slow moving um, kind of approach. Right. So. Yeah, and I think it's more, and this is me playing devil's advocate, but also obviously we see that in the training space too. And what I've learned over time is the fear-free trademark type thing is more of a marketing yeah, thing. I think so. For like your business, you can say fear-free because it doesn't matter what course you take or what you do if that dog comes in terrified because if you have the essential oils and you have the treats and they're still terrified, they're still very, very fearful. Yeah, yes. You've just tried <laughs> to do everything you can to make it less fearful for the dog, which I personally would argue and believe that anybody – that really cares and is professional is trying to do that anyway. Mm -hmm. But we just don't pay for a stamp that says fear free. Because right. to me, if you're in the dog space professionally, you know that that's impossible. Mm -hmm. Like even Lakota, my dog, when I bring her, she's, she's hates it. Cause she's like, she's like, I don't, cause she knows she's going to get her nails clipped yep. or whatever. She tolerates it. Like most dogs probably tolerate it. Yeah. There's very few dogs that enjoy it. Right. And that's, you know, it's like, we have a ton of dogs. They run up the ramp. They come in. They're so excited to see us. They'll even, they don't even care that mom and dad are leaving. You know, they're like, yay, we're here at the groomer. So much fun. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as they get behind that door, they're like, ah, oh, crap. Yeah. You know? And, and, for the most part, I would say most of our, our dogs, like, they like being there. You know, they're pretty accustomed to the process now. Um, but there's very few that are actually like, oh, this is the best. Right. You know, I have one yellow lab that I've been grooming for, oh, my gosh, pretty much my whole career. Her name's Stevie. The dog loves being blow-dried. So you start blow-drying her near her face, and she just leans into it, and all of her flappy, like, float folds are flying all over the place, and she loves it. Yeah. That's not the normal, you know, yeah. case. It's like... We don't really like, I don't know very many people that like going to the dentist. Right. I hate it. I'm so fearful of the dentist. Right. But I go because I have to. Right. You know, and that's the thing. It's like that's kind of the balancing act that we have to do in the grooming world. It's like, okay, if this dog is terrified and anxious and stressed out by this process, there are certain things that we have to get done right. for this dog's health. We have to get their nails done. We have, you know, if it's a long-haired dog in the face, we have to get eye boogers out. We have to get mats off. Um, so there's that balancing act of like, what is again, best for the dog? Mm -hmm. You know, no, we're not going to stress a dog out to the point that it gets sick, which can happen. You know, we're not going to push them. So it's just developing a plan for each individual dog mm -hmm. as they walk in the door. Yeah. Yeah. And I find that a lot of uh, like uh, one big request that we have, and we've actually created a program for can like canine professionals to like learn like they're like how do I start what do I like groomers or dog walkers or uh, dog trainers they're like what do I do to start the business like I have this gift right like I'm good with animals like that's what I'm going to decide to do but I don't know how to like start it so <clears throat> I guess I'm saying that because there's a lot of people who will be listening to the podcast and hearing this watching this podcast in the future where I I'm just saying that you can it's like anything else in business like you can get like you can go on and pay money, take a course, and then say, and it's beneficial. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good things in there, but it's more a marketing thing where you can tell your clients, like, we're well, free. And to me, it's a little deceiving because it's, it's impossible to say that unless right. you turn people away, you know, right. where you're like, the dog is shaking and you're like, oh, this is, and you're like, you got, it. so I'm just, I, I know you know this. Mm -hmm. I'm just, um, bringing it back up for people. It's a probably, a, I'm, I haven't looked into it, but it's probably a great course with a lot of good information, but just know that when you're taking courses and same thing on the other end, like you have to make sure that you're diverse mm -hmm. because the dogs that come into you are so diverse Yeah, <laughs> and the people, yeah, like they're going to, they're especially with behavioral stuff. Like mm -hmm. they could have bad experiences with past groomers Mom or dad may have tried it at home with the nails, and it's like forget oh, yeah. it trauma. <laughs> yeah, so you, so it's this. It's interesting. This is like the same. It's the same thing uh, as as you know the dog training community is. There's different camps. Mm -hmm. One uh, disagrees with the and and I always tell people like that's always like don't. So I used to get discouraged about it, where I'd be like, I just mentally I'd yeah. get discouraged. I'd be like, it sucks to see. People say the same thing with you. Like you may have used that that groomer, the like, groomer's helper, the groomer's helper, yeah. like groom a dog that could never be groomed, and after three grooms, they're way more comfortable. And then there's going to be somebody that's like, yeah, but they use this, and therefore, and you're like, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, but it's the same thing. Yeah. So it's interesting to hear. Yeah. It's really a matter of like knowing. So like I took a, a class on um, like working with difficult dogs over the weekend at the convention and you're not, there's no blanket way of handling dogs. Mm -hmm. Like you said, they're all so diverse. Owners are diverse. Dogs are so diverse. So you are training the dog that's in front of you. You're working with the dog that's on your table. I have some dogs that get super aggressive if they get extra restraint. Um, this one doodle started coming to us like a year and a half or so ago. And, you know, they told us he's a little sensitive. He's a little, you know, wary. We don't know his history. He was a rescue. Um, we, get, we get him in the bath. He's fine. Get him on the table. He's mostly fine. And then he started to get a little weird. So, you know, we hooked him up for safety reasons. And that was like, nope. He was not happy with that. He let us know he was not happy with that. Um, and my other groomer was the one originally working with him. And she was like, I don't feel comfortable doing this. And I was like, okay, let's give him a break. Get him off the table. Give him a break. Um, so when, you, when you're hooking him up, is it just like a flat collar? Lead? Yeah, so it's just like a, um, like a nylon lead. I actually just bought a new style that's um, like, a, like a polyester um, – I can't think of the materials, but it's biothane. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That. And so it's, you know, antimicrobial yep. and all that good stuff and it doesn't get wet. And I'm really excited. Um, doesn't get stinky either. No, exactly. I don't have to soak them every so often. You know, they stay nice and clean and yeah. easily disinfected. Um, but yeah, so it's a loop that goes around the neck and then it hooks to a bar that goes above. Um, and then <clears throat> when you need some extra like support or like some dogs are more comfortable with more restraint. You know, then we have the hook that it hooks to the front and it hooks to the front of the pole. Um, but yeah, this guy in particular, once I got him on the table, um, and that's like another important thing to know, like even in one business, like not, I can't groom every dog that walks in the door. Like I don't connect with every, every all of them. My other groomer, you know, sh there's been dogs that I've had on my table, and I'm like, I don't, I can't seem to, like, get this dog to cooperate. I don't, he doesn't like me. You know, I can't even get eye contact with him. So we'll trade. Why don't you try? Yeah. And all of a sudden, the dog loves her, you know? So you just can't take that stuff personal. But back to um, this doodle. Once I got him on the table, I was like, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to try. I'm just going to try to trust him. He's not showing me any signs that he's going to be aggressive right now. Um, so let's just not hook him up. So I just had him on the table. Our tables go to about eight inches off the floor. Um, so I had him, the table all the way down on the floor. I did his whole groom. No problems. No growls. A couple little, like, you know, curly lips when I did his nails. No, I'm sorry. I actually wasn't able to do his nails. His parents told us, like, don't do the nails. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but after a course of a year of grooming him regularly, now I can do his nails. And I can shave his pads. And he kisses me the entire time he's on the table. You know, so it's just a matter of figuring out what works best for each dog. Mm -hmm. Some dogs don't want any restraint at all, and they're perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. Some dogs need that, like, they need to feel, like, safe and secure. You know, some dogs don't like heights, so you have to groom them on the floor. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of, you know, knowing the dog on your table and doing what that dog requires and not what some blanket statement, right. you know, says you should be doing. Right. Yeah, it's just, I think, it, like, with any industry, when you, you know, it's interesting because there's different categories of everything. Again, like food or even a realtor. They're like, oh, I do commercial or mm -hmm. I do high end or I do whatever. But they can all sell and they're different, but they're just niche down. But it's just so interesting right when you start dealing with dogs how, many gatekeepers there are yeah. <laughs> on like, nope, 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 this is, <clears throat> can't do this, can't do that. But I, what we, my friend Forrest had kind of coined this, uh, cause we deal, you know, again with the same thing is, um, there's limited dog trainers and then there's unlimited dog trainers. So limited dog trainers are dog trainers who have a limit on what they can do with what's in their toolbox, what their techniques and methods allow them to do for the dog that's in front of them. Mm -hmm. Now, if at any point the dog doesn't fit within that criteria, then the professional has an option to either say, this isn't for me, or this is impossible. And for me, a judge, a good judge of character for that person is, if they're going to say this is impossible, then that's when you know that they're, they, their ego is too big for them to yes. refer somebody else out or to say, hey, this isn't what I can do. And it's the same thing with you, mm -hmm. isn't it? Because yeah. you, so go, so you just went to this big 
almost a th- three full day event grooming training or a, a canine world of a seminar mm-hmm. pr- primarily with grooming though. yeah it's pretty much all grooming yeah there's some like other stuff thrown in there but it's met for groomers mostly what was your biggest takeaway um because you had the behavioral courses you had yeah, all these new yep. equipment you had all, meeting all these new groomers. Like, what was? I know you're still not really done from it because you you ju- you're just coming back from yeah. it. Yeah. But what was like the big thing, the big pieces of information or things that you've learned? So, um, probably my favorite class that I took was um, working with primitive breeds. Um, so working with your double coated and triple coated dogs, um, which I that's one of my favorite things to do, like your big D sheds and stuff like that. Um, so that was a very science-based course. I am not a science-based girl. Um, <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, that feels right, you know? Right. I have, so hearing all these facts and stuff about, like, the DNA in these dogs and, you know, evolution of their coats and stuff like that was really interesting. And like I mentioned earlier, um, the double and triple-coated dogs, that is a huge um, division in our industry. Um, and, you know... What are, what are, what's an example of a triple-coated dog? Uh, so like your Samoyeds, um, your Malamutes, dogs like that. So a double-coated dog is one that has like your guard hair, and then they have the short, fluffy... Like the insulator. Yeah, the insulator hair. Yeah. So a triple-coated dog has an even shorter third layer of that insulation. Wow. So yeah, and you know, and I mistakenly have been grooming them the same way I groom my double-coated dogs, and I'd been getting frustrated, like, why can't I get this out? Like, why can't I get a comb through, like, mm. Kobe? Mm-hmm. But I can get a comb through Kendall, mm-hmm. you know? And that's because they have different coats. Right. So they're very similar, but you're never going to get, like, on a, you know, a normal husky, you can get all the undercoat out. You can run a comb all the way down to the skin, like, once that's all cleared. On a Malamute, you can't. Mm-hmm. Because you're not supposed to, because they have that extra layer that's close to the skin. So you can comb through about two thirds of it, and then the rest is left until that goes through its full cycle and it comes out. Mm. So, wow. yeah, there's so a whole. I want to walk through that. Sure. For myself. <laughs> so, triple coated for the popular breeds, the Samoyeds, the Alas, the Malamutes. Mm-hmm. What are some other popular triple coated so just to give frame a reference yeah to be honest those are the two main ones that i know of um and i don't want to misquote myself and okay. like say so, any that aren't that's fine so yeah. there's the guard hair which well, is shiba inus shibas, shibas. yeah okay. shibas are another triple okay so guard hair which is like the coat that everyone will see on it's like the coarse hair on the mm-hmm. outside the insulator coat is that fluffy stuff that comes off and then for those breeds the triple coated breeds those are dogs that have uh, then another tighter insulator fuzzy mm-hmm. little thing on them and you when you're grooming and this is uh, like I don't know anything about this so I'm <laughs> excited to learn yeah. so when you're grooming let's just say f- in general when you get a dog in like Colby that's a Alaskan Malamute husky siberian type mix thing but mostly he's got that third layer or whatever Mm -hmm. what is your objective because do dogs have well this is fun do do dogs have (laughs) seasonal i know that they blow their coat yep twice a year or does it depend on the breed yeah it's usually it's usually on the equinox and the solstice that they blow their coat um but most dogs uh their their coat cycles on like a 21 day cycle so and this is where like all the science stuff that i don't that i'm just learning is like coming into play there's uh i believe it's like four different cycles of the hair so you have like of the guard hair so you have your growth cycle and then it gets to a point where it's fully grown and it sits dormant and then it starts to die off and then it falls out so you have all these cycles now if you that's for your guard hairs. Mm-hmm. Um, and in your guard hairs, there are three layers. Again, if I, I should have brought notes with me. I no, it's good. Thinking. It's all good. Um, so, you're, you know, you have like your core. So it's just like a human hair. You right. have like your shaft. It's like the stretchy part of your hair. Then you have, you know, two outer layers. So that's your guard hair. And then you're, I don't want to get in. I don't know if I want to get into all the details. Okay. I'll, I don't want to misspeak. And so, yeah, but you don't have to. Just get general. So okay. do- dogs will typically blow their coats twice a year yeah and then when you're so the groomer so my point is is 
dog owners aren't going to, and me included, aren't going to say, oh, it's the solstice. That means I have, like, <laughs> I'm just saying, like, okay, my dog's nails are clicking. My dog is dirty. My dog is shedding. Like, what is your objective when you get a dog in just in general? Like, for a groom, like a full groom, mm -hmm. you want to get, like, the dead hair off like wh what's what's the goal yeah so that i mean for any like double or triple coated dog that is the goal is to remove the uh undercoat that's already loose so if you're not um and actually i learned something from you um years ago that i have implemented about elderly dogs but that's like a whole nother thing but yeah so you want you want to safely and comfortably remove that undercoat mm -hmm. so these dogs they sh they're gonna shed all the time basically and, and I, I hear that's a regular complaint that we get. You know, it's like, oh, my dog was just here and he's still shedding. Well, yeah, I just went to the hairdresser, but my hair's still falling out. You know, they're mammals. We're all mammals. We all have hair. We all have fur, mm -hmm. you know. And so it's always constantly cycling and falling out. But, yes, you have those generally in the spring and the fall, you have those big molting sessions where they are releasing all of that thick undercoat and the opportunity for the new coat to grow in. Mm -hmm. So that's when you see like the tufts that you can just pull yeah. out. Like there's that video that went around, I don't know how long ago. I think it was like a collie sitting on a porch and there's a bird coming in and pulling the hair out of its butt, yeah. you know? So that, that is when you have that molting process. So that if you aren't getting your, you know, we see a lot of these types of dogs that don't need haircuts, you know? They're like, oh, I don't need to get my dog groomed. I'll just bathe it at home or it goes in the pond. It's fine. But the problem is if you don't remove that undercoat, especially during those heavy sheds, it starts to like kind of fold over on itself and start to interlock. And then you get an impacted coat. And so that's when you're restricting airflow to your dog's skin. You're trapping moisture and bacteria by your, bacteria by your dog's skin. Um, it can even get to the point where it's restricting movement. Um, so it's really important that that mm -hmm. undercoat is removed on a regular basis, but especially during like those molting seasons. So yeah, that's, that's the objective. And, um, we'll get a lot of people, well, actually we don't get a lot so much anymore, but we used to get a lot of people that would come in and be like, oh, he shed so much. Can you just shave him? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, so that was the, one of the big things that we were discussing in this class um, over the weekend is the science behind why it's not safe to shave these dogs. Um, all dogs or No, uh, double and triple Got coated it. dogs. Yep. So like there is, you know, uh, there was a guy that wrote a book, I don't know, like a few years ago, and he kind of coined the phrase as fur versus hair. Um, so fur is a predetermined length of coat. So the, the fur grows to a certain length and then it stops. Um, hair will grow until you cut it. So it's like, I like, got it. Yeah. yeah. So like your arm hair is fur, right. your head hair is hair. Right. Um, so when you have a dog that has fur, you really don't want to cut that because it, you're just creating a whole nother realm of possibilities of it not growing back of them developing alopecia of you know of them needing of it of the, exactly like they need older. or if it's hot right you know their fur is there especially when you have that double and triple coat it is an insulation from heat and cold um, think about like people in the middle east that live in the desert and it's you know 100 degrees do they walk around outside in bikinis and naked because they're hot. No, they are covered head to toe. Right. Because that heat and the sun blasting on their bodies causes skin cancer. Dogs can get skin cancer. Um, you know, causes sunburn, causes all sorts of problems, causes them to overheat. So maintaining a properly maintained double coat is going to actually keep your dog cooler than a shaved coat. Right, because one would think that, again, dog, like a pet owner would be like, my dog is hot mm -hmm. in the summer, like Thompson, perfect yeah. example, like 150 pound St. Bernard during the summer would be hot. And if I were to shave him, it would make it worse because now if he goes outside, there's nothing to protect him from the sun mm -hmm. and there's nothing to protect him from that heat. But I think it's a, even for me, and it just logically doesn't make sense that more means more protection from heat. You would just assume that if you have more coats on in the summer, like if I put 
three Patagonias on in the summer, it's going to suck. Right. But for them, it just, it's different. Well, and it's not so much that more coat is better because like I said, you have to remove that undercoat and that is why dogs shed. So like your dogs, your dog is an evolutionary, like amazing creature. So they, their coats change with the seasons. Mm -hmm. So you'll notice like, you know, your husky is going to have a thicker coat in the winter because it requires that insulation. In the summer, it's going to have less undercoat. They're, they also have, um, this was a cool thing I learned too, they have like muscles in their follicles and that's what allows them to like raise like their hackles and stuff yeah. like that. And so that also allows them to lift their hair to allow more airflow through. So it's like if you, I'm trying to think that's of. interesting. Yeah, so like um, I also I ride motorcycles too, and so I have a lot of friends that like they'll just go out in a t-shirt when it's so hot out, and I wear full leathers all the time, and they'll be dying on their bike in an 80 degree day, and I'm like cool as a cucumber, and that's because I'm insulating myself from the heat. Right. You know, so it's that it's that layer of protection basically. Yeah, that's badass. That's cool. So okay, so getting back to the grooming process. And then we're gonna we're gonna answer some of the questions from people on Instagram. But uh, well, actually, one of them is um, how how often. So let's just say you get a do you have a dog, you adopted a dog, or you're listening to this podcast, and afterwards you're like, oh shit, I need to find a groomer <laughs> because this isn't because because I think the general public would just assume like we were talking about before we started is they jumped in the pond, mm -hmm. they're clean, or yeah. I hose them off. But n knowing what we're talking about now is there needs to be some sort of professional process to get all of that out because they can blow a lot of it, but mm -hmm. there's still some. And then once the new insulator starts to grow and the old one's still hanging around, they can get in. That's where the matting happens yep. and they can't cool themselves off in the winter or in the summer and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So it's important to groom your dogs regardless of how much they're in the water and how much you brush them. This may be like a polarizing question, maybe not at all for you, but I've read just like anything else, like people will say, oh, I read this about dog training behavior. And I'm like, well, yeah. I've seen this and I've seen that. You got to read it between the lines. Yeah. But like the Furminator is one of those things that we, I, I, like as pet owners, again, like as you're kind of going through the internet of all the armchair experts as well as professional experts, uh, you know, some of it say like, oh, it cuts the hair and the others say, oh, it's like, great. So like, we'll get into the grooming process before, but be because I've already like teed up that question. Yeah. What's the deal with the Furminator? And it looks great. It yeah. works, but. So the Furminator, I won't, I will never say never to anything, you right. know, because there's always some niche for something to work. The Furminator um, is a tool that can be used on some of your really short haired shedding dogs, like pugs and things like that. Absolutely. Even the long haired Furminator, do not use it on your Husky or your German Shepherd or anything like that, simply because there are better tools out there. There's safer tools out there. Um, the Furminator does cut coat, it's a razor blade. Um, and the Furminator was developed um, by like this process that we do called carding. So it's a certain angle that you hold um, a bladed edge and it, you use it to remove undercoat. So that was in the professional realm. Like we are trained to do that without breaking the coat. So somebody was like, oh, let's put that on a handle and sell it to consumers. Well, if you're not using that at the proper angle, you, all you're doing is cutting your dog's hair and you're damaging it. And mm. you, can over, you can overuse it and damage your dog's skin. You know, it's just, I don't even have one in my shop. I had one years ago and I used it for a little while and then it, it sat in my drawer for a couple of years. I never touched it, and I finally just threw it away. Okay, so but it works because that's the that's the satisfying thing about the Furminator is your dog is starting that process. Like Lola used to have all these little. It was so satisfying to pluck those yeah, little yeah. things that are coming off. Like, um, and and I don't know really what she was mixed with, um, but she had that really thick undercoat, and the Furminator would just like get balls of it out. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, but it, it's not, so you just don't recommend it. People should either find a groomer. What, what are some other tools that yeah. are safer? So, I mean, you can use, you can even just use a slicker brush. Um, my husband has, we have a 16 year old 
border collie shepherd mix. He's a Murph. We don't really know what he is, but <laughs> mm-hmm. um, when I like, you know, I'm always bringing home different tools and stuff. And he's like, I don't know why you bring home all these fancy de shedding tools. He's like, I got that brush out there on the porch. And I'm like, your stupid plastic brush, like a oh, fine, I'll use it. Like just, just to appease you, I'll use your stupid brush. Yeah. That stupid brush will pull out bags of hair from this dog. So again, it's like, not every tool is right for every dog. Um, so there's slicker brushes that you can use. Um, there's rakes that are, um, they're called de-shedding rakes. Um, they, you can use those. Um, there's this thing called an equi groomer um, that works really great on, you know, again, your shorter coated shedding dogs, like your pugs, your labs, things like that. Um, it's basically, it's a horse that used to be just like a horse rake. Um, and then they started making a smaller version for dogs. Is that um, the little like, thing that has the little teeth and it's rounded like that and it's like a metal little teeth thing. no I know I know what you're talking about there I've never used that on a dog no it's like a um it's it's on like a wooden block and it's got it it almost similarly looks like um a furminator but it's not a blade so it's like a um it's got all these little little yeah it's got like little tiny teeth yeah. um so again like I I don't use it on longer coated dogs just to eliminate any risk of cutting them it's not a blade so it's not really going to cut um but yeah those would be my recommendations a good slicker brush and honestly your best friend after you brush your dog is a metal tooth comb because that'll continue to pull out any of that extra hair so slicker than metal tooth comb yep you can go on amazon and find those oh yeah easily enough um and you can look for specifically like a de-shedding brush not just like not the furminator because you know that's the first thing that's gonna yeah that's going to be one of the first things that come up and then there's also the rake which is like a little hooked tooth you know blade yeah and that works really good for like your huskies and things like that okay and so interesting yeah because that's that's the same thing again like with any industry i remember just side note Mm -hmm. i remember I used to own this property, a two unit in Mechanicville, where Taylor and I lived for years. And I we lived on one side, and we had tenants upstairs. And it was an old building, so there's always things going on: plumbing, heating. You know, we learned a lot. And I, I had this OG plumber in all the time. His name was Tom too, and he's the nicest guy ever. And he'd always like cut me a break and come over. Ah, well, I'm really booked up, but you know, that kind of guy, come help you out. And he was the nicest guy ever. And anyway, there's this, uh, there was this, uh, clog that we had that was upstairs. One of my tenants did whatever. I don't know what it was, but I, (laughs) I just came out with like what I thought was a good thing was Mm -hmm. like the plumber, like, uh, like you know the the clog remover yeah like the snake thing or? no no it was like the liquid that you oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Boom, like boom, a drain yeah. yeah yeah he's like get that shit out of here that's terrible <laughs> and i'm thinking like well that's the easiest thing to find ever in grow in supermarkets or whatever and it works but he's like you don't know how it works you don't know why it works it's terrible don't use it because it ruins like everything blah yeah, blah blah yeah. and he's like yeah you, you think it's like gonna cut it's gonna um what do you say he's like yeah, it's going to go in and just dissolve this whatever's in there, but what do you think it's going to do after it does that down in your septic mm-hmm. and down through all Anyway, it's just one of those things, though, same thing. Yeah, so it's what's like, oh, marketed to you. Yeah, 100%. You know? And you don't know why it works. You don't know, you know, any of that. And it's so. very rare. It's just, it's it's so funny. It's I, I talk about this all the time. Like, it's very, um, it's like if it's really good, chances are it's probably bad for you. you yeah. Know? Same thing with, like, food. <laughs> yeah, food. Right? Like, like. McDonald's tastes good, but it's terrible for you. So bad for Soda you. Soda tastes good, but it's terrible for you. And like, I've been, you know, as you grow up and mature, you realize these things of mm-hmm. like back in the day, the shit that we used to eat was oh, like, yeah. oh, and now you're like, <laughs> why did I eat that? Why did I eat that? Right. And oh, but it, it will still wreck Taco Bell like any day. Exactly. Of the week. <laughs> That's what I was just, it's funny. I was just, I was just, my staff was in here and we have vegans on staff, vegetarians on staff, you know, meteors on staff. And we were talking about, um, Taco Bell, and I was like, man, I haven't had Taco Bell in years. I said, I, I typically eat Taco Bell like twice a year, mm-hmm. and it's when Taylor and I, f- we have some flights really late from Albany, and the only thing that's open, this is like 11.30, 12.30 at night, yeah. if it's from my West Coast flight, is the Taco Bell on like Wolf Street or Wolf Road, I think, in Albany, right there by Hooters down there, mm-hmm. and we'll go and we'll get, and it's like, that's the only time I'll do it, and I know it's bad, but anyway, but it's <laughs> funny because I was like, same thing is like light bulb went off. I'm like, this works and the Furminator works. But if yeah. you don't know 
how it if it's too good to be true it probably is right right yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, i mean there's always like again there's always like a cost to everything yeah you know and yeah do i well again i will never say never like yes the furminator i do not recommend it um but it does have its limited place in its in its use and you know a lot of groomers still use them and that's fine you know, just please don't damage coats with them. Know what you're doing. Know the tools that you're using, basically. Exactly. Same thing with what I do. Mm -hmm. Like e-collars, prong collars, Martin Gill collars, slip collars. Mar like any type of thing that you can use, there's a right way and a wrong way. And it sounds like if you use the Furminator right and you know how to use it, it's great. Yeah. But they're not marketing it to professionals. Right. They're marketing it to me. Right. I'm like, and that's me. I'm like out there and I got three bags of fur and I'm like this is the best this thing is the ever best. right and it's so easy <laughs> oh and another tool that I forgot to mention which really probably is like one of the gentlest and very satisfying tools is a zoom groom or a zoom? rubber rubber curry brush so rubber curry brush yeah I gotta look that up to see what that looks the like the zoom groom is like the most well-known one um and it's just like it's like a mess oh it's so great like I want oh, a wow. human one and it were, you can use it, yeah, you can use it in the bath. So like I use that on like my labs and stuff like that in the bathtub, get them all sudsed up with shampoo and then you massage them with that. It loosens up. Yep. That's the thing. Abby's going to have to put this up for people who are <laughs> watching, but for people who are listening, it's basically, it looks like a, one of those like things that you would put treats in and your dog can work out. It's like a little rubber thing that has rubber. It's like silicone. Yeah. It's got little like rubbery teeth. teeth. Yeah. yeah. So it stimulates the hair follicle, it helps loosen up dander, mm. and it gets, I mean, it gets a ton of undercoat out. That's so great. It, yeah. That's yeah. They're really one. awesome. Yeah. They're very safe. Safe one for you guys. I'm going to- You can use it wet and dry. Perfect. I'm going to get one of those. Um, let's go over some questions from Instagram. So how, so, and this is general. So like when I do lives or I do podcasts or I do things, it's like, oh, what's the best way to use this? And you're like- I don't have three hours to like, this is general, right? <laughs> yeah. So don't, don't be overwhelmed with like, well, if you have this or you have that. So how often typically like the average dog owner, the average dog outside of the th triple coated. Mm -hmm. So the Shibas, the Samoids, the Malamutes, how often should dog owners be grooming their dogs or bringing them to a groomer? Yeah. So, you know, it, it is a very vast difference. So if you have a dog that requires a haircut, um, you know, it should be about a four to eight week schedule. And that all depends on your dog's coat type, your dog, your lifestyle. So if you're a very active person and you're taking your dog hiking and swimming, keeping it in a shorter haircut or getting it groomed more often is the best thing to do. I mean, in, as an overall general rule, I would say a maximum of eight weeks for most dogs. Your short hair dogs and things like that that are, that are just baths, it's more or less like, oh, you stink? It's time for you to mm -hmm. go to the groomer. Um, you know, if you have a dog that really doesn't require any grooming besides nail trimming, that should be done every three to four weeks. Again, if you, you know, if you have a very active dog that runs on the pavement a lot or, you know, goes like hiking on the rocks and things like that, that's going to naturally keep their nails filed back. So you don't have to do it as often. Um, but yeah, as far as like your normal client that comes to the groomer, which is your, you know, your Shih Tzus, your Poodles, your Doodles, all that stuff. Four to six weeks is ideal, um, but a maximum of eight weeks. And that's even for dogs. So every two months is a maximum time you should bring your dog. So that's even, because I'm really ignorant with the cut. So there's a big difference. So there's certain dogs that will come in, let's say Sheba's I'm sorry, let's say Shih Tzus, mm -hmm. dogs that if you don't groom them, they can't see or yeah. whatever. So there's dogs that will require haircuts. Because for me, grooming is a brush and a bath. Right. But Yeah, and so for you, it's like, oh, Lakota, you stink and you're shedding. Let's call Liz. You know, so it doesn't have to be like quite as as a, you know, regimented, like focused thing. Um, but with your dog and, and side note to all of that, one thing to remember about your groomer is we are kind of the middleman between you and your vet. Mm. So we don't see your dog as often as you do. Obviously you see your dog every day, but we see your dog a lot more often than your vet usually. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we see your dog every four weeks, every six weeks, every eight weeks, we can start to notice subtle differences in your dog's weight, your dog's behavior, um, your dog's mobility, uh, lumps and things like that, that you might not see on an everyday basis. Yeah. Um, and so we're kind of like a, um, 
like a middleman or like a first responder basically to yeah. like catch certain health issues. So the more often your dog sees a groomer, um, a, the better the relationship your dog is going to have with that professional, um, the better experience they're going to have because they're more desensitized to everything. They, they get more used to it. And also it gives us the opportunity. I know for me personally, and for my staff, we basically do like a little health check on each dog. We check their eyes, we check their ears, we check their, you know, bums and stuff like that. Like I check my dog's butt all the time. I know most normal <laughs> dog people don't always look at their at these areas of their dogs, the pads of their feet, you know, their skin, things like that, that, you know, when you see it every day, you might not notice a subtle change. You might not notice that, hmm, their breathing seems a little bit labored. You might want to get this checked out. You know, I noticed this time her ear had some, you know, smelly funk in it that wasn't there last time. You may want to get that checked out by your vet. So the more often they get seen by the groomer, you know, the more often some of these things can be caught and, mm -hmm. you know, headed off before it becomes like a major health issue. Yeah, so being proactive instead of reactive. And we talk about that a lot in training too, and the vets. Pretty much anything that you want, your in, in daycare, boarding, dog walking, anything that, like don't wait for the to, for there to be a problem. Yes. Like, hey, your dog, no, no matter what type of dog, if it's a boxer or it's a Malamute, like your dog is going to require some sort of like hygiene mm -hmm. for, for them professionally. It's not just like we threw them out back in the tub right. or we sprayed them off with the hose and they, you know, we're playing with it. Like there's so much more to it than that because it's not about – the, is your dog smelly or it has your dog rolled around in dirt? It's more about their hygiene yeah. of getting that coat out to make sure it airs out, to make sure it doesn't get matted, to then creating bacteria and yeast and, and all that nasty stuff mm -hmm. that can, can cause damage. Because I think it's the same thing with dog training. I primarily, actually 99.9% .9 of all of my work is behavioral. So I don't, I don't work with dogs who don't have any problems and people just want to train them. I'm always fixing something right. or trying to. <laughs> and so the earlier you get these dogs in, the better it's going to be for them because you already start a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. So they're like, oh, we're going to Liz. This is going to be great. And I know what to expect and whatever. But but people don't do that usually. They wait for there to be. Yeah. And problem. actually you touched on something that's extremely important and kind of overlooked in our industry too is that you know everybody when they get a puppy you know they know that you have to go to the vet and get started on vaccines and things like that a lot of people know that you should get into like a puppy class and obedience training the other thing you should do is get to a groomer mm -hmm. um i mean it's in our, in our shop we in in, in uh, New York state law requires us to have rabies. So we have to wait till your dog has his rabies vaccine. But so right around four to five months. And if you wait until a year to call us to get an appointment for your puppy and your dog has never been groomed before, I'm sorry, we only take puppies mm -hmm. between that four to six months because there is that whole period of puppyhood where their brains are developing and their social habits are developing and they're going through all those fear stages and things like that. And it is, our puppies are, you know, like I said, they we start them at four to six months. They're on a four week schedule, mandatory, so that we can keep reinforcing the training that they've had on the table so that we can keep desensitizing them to that kind of stuff. And it's also just a great way to work on the cooperative care. So, you know, your dog needs, like every dog at some point in time is going to need to be manipulated and touched by a stranger, whether it's your vet, a trainer, whatever. And so starting all of that. So if you're starting your dog in puppy classes, start your dog with a groomer, mm -hmm. you know, because we're also going to reinforce a lot of the things that your trainer is working with you on. And it's just a great way to start that foundation for your dog, to get your dog socialized, get your dog used to the whole process, especially if you have a doodle, please, mm -hmm. please. If anything gets through to anybody out there on the podcast, if you get a doodle puppy, get a groomer right away, Yeah, <laughs> please Yeah, <laughs> on behalf of all groomers. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I, and I think it's, I hear that a lot with dog owners too, about the vet. Like it's one of my not most requested, frequently asked question, but it's a huge one. Mm -hmm. Like, how do I help my dog get better at the vet? And it's even harder for veterinarians because they typically aren't like spying them out. You know, right. they're not washing them and rubbing them. They're touch. They're probing them, poking them. Mm -hmm. You know, medicating them, and and they're only seeing them 
once, maybe twice a year, yeah. unless something bad happens. Yeah, if that. Yeah. So that's the same exact thing. And veterinarians, and I, we could talk about this in a minute for groomers, I don't want to say, but veterinarians are not typically, ha- they don't have any training in behavior, none. Yeah. Zero. Mm-hmm. The amount of vets that I talk to who take my courses or my clients who benefit from just me working with their dog or watching me work, like most of our seminar, not most of, but majority of our seminars, uh, the audience are professionals. Some of them are, most of them are trainers. And then there's the groomers and vets or mm-hmm. vet techs because they just want to get, they don't have any of that. Right. They just want to add that to their. Yeah. We did a, um, we did some research a couple of years ago on it. I can't remember which college it was, but I think the most behavioral training, any veterinarian, gets in the United States is two weeks Mm. out of all the years of school and it sucks for them because they're not trained in it and and typically and I have I have vets in my immediate fam like my family my close family and obviously friends and colleagues and stuff and they know it too is they're like I'm on a schedule like I have 30 minutes like I gotta go because it's a money thing um like a it's a business right you can't like, oh, I'm just going to come to your house and get to know uh, your dog, you know, in the, like in my, in my spare time. Like, mm-hmm. that's not going to happen. Right. <laughs> but it's the same thing with, with grooming. And that's why I wanted to have you on is because grooming doesn't get enough exposure on how-tos, in my opinion. You know, I've been in the industry now for over a decade, uh, primarily focusing on education and content. And we don't see a lot of it because yeah. I don't know why it's like I don't well because it's it's like again it's that perception that the only dogs that really need grooming are poodles right you know it's like oh my dog doesn't get a haircut my dog doesn't need you know and so I think that's where a lot of it, it grooming was seen as like a, a privilege or as like a spa treatment right. or you know as something like that that you do you know because you love your dog you know mm-hmm. but it's really not it's really a matter of health Um, and again, like I, not every single dog needs to go to a groomer. Like my, my, I have two pit bulls. Uh, I bathe them at home myself. You know, they don't really, like I can do their nails at home safely. Um, I can't, and this was even before I was a groomer. I can express their anal glands. I can put them in the tub and bathe them and, and clean their ears and that kind of thing. Um, if you can do all that stuff for your dog at home safely, that's great. Then you, you don't have to bring your dog to a groomer. Um, if your dog is like a, you know, short haired dog like that, that gets super stressed out at the groomer that, you know, it's, you know, you, a lot of people will say, oh, I want her to have a spa day. Well, for most dogs, like coming to the grooming salon isn't a relaxing experience, (laughs) especially if they only come once a year. Um, so if you are going to have your dog, your short haired dog, your, you know, whatever, um, if you are going to have that dog groomed, don't make it a once a year thing because you think you're doing something special for your dog. Get them on a schedule with the same people. Mm -hmm. You know, I do have quite a few pit bulls that come in every four to six weeks for baths. They're my favorite clients. It's no like secret that pit bulls are my favorite. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But you know, it's, it's, it really is all about consistency, just like anything else in the dog world, just like training, just like your vet care. It's about being consistent and building that relationship with the dog. So even bringing, yeah. So anyway, people, uh, (laughs) when you get your dog, regardless of if you just adopted a dog from the shelter that's five or you got a puppy, Mm -hmm. you go to your groomer and just say like, hey, I want to start this off right. I want to start this off in general. I don't want, that's what I tell my clients about the vet. I'm like, I can't do anything about your dog having a problem with the vet. I can't do anything. Yeah, You already created that. Mm -hmm. But to be fair, I, I did a, talk at a college uh this last year about how to how to help dogs become more successful or dog owners become more successful in their environment because they're they're the they just sit there and wait for dogs to come in and yeah they can have uh prereq stuff of like here's what we suggest here's what or like you like nope I'm only taking this age or whatever they don't they don't really know how to set it up because right. like, I'm that middleman. I'm mm-hmm. there's the dog owner, here's the vet, and I'm the person in the middle. And so I always tell people if there's veterinarian clinics or even grooming clinics that just say like I tell people ask your vet 
if you can just come in randomly and use the scale that's in the lobby and then make it a good experience and then leave. Yes. I love that, Tom. I, and we, I love doing that for people. Like if I have a new client that calls and, you know, they had a bad experience someplace else or, you know, their dog is very nervous. I, we always will do free consultations always. And, you know, if the dog is hesitant coming in the door, I'll meet him outside. Mm -hmm. I'll sit with you on the ramp for a few minutes. You know, it's, Getting those small doses of positive exposure to the place. Um, I have this dog I've been working on just for nail trims for like two months now. Mm. His dad would bring him in every, like twice a week, just bring him in. The first couple of times I just hung out with him in the lobby, got him like settled down. And then I started by putting him on the table, getting him used to being on the table. I mean, this process went on for two months before I could even trim this dog's nails. But that is sometimes what we have to do. And the owner, the pet parent, has to be open to that, you know. And mm -hmm. some people's schedules don't allow that, and I understand, you know. But getting those small doses of positive experience is, is huge for, again, establishing a nice foundation, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's the same thing with if, you're, if you and your family travel or if you travel, getting your dog exposed to – the daycare that they're going to go to or the mm -hmm. boarding place or the dog walker, don't wait for you to be like, oh. We're leaving in a week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're leaving yeah. in a week and we've never left our dog with anybody. Mm -hmm. Why don't you come on, you know, and like these are things like, oh, we go to North Carolina twice a year. We go to like, like these are things that you got to do when you get your dog, help them. That's why I always tell people I, and same thing with you, I'm sure, is you're just putting out problems. Mm -hmm. Like, you get the like the easy dogs that come in like the eight week old or not the eight week old puppies but after they're done with all their rounds of shots and the, the six month old puppy that's like just excited to be there and you're grooming them and they're like that was great and they leave and then they come back in a month they're like oh you again great mm -hmm. but having the dogs in where they're like oh my dog's matted or my dog got sprayed by a skunk or like mm -hmm. whatever the case is and then they get there and now you're like it's you're putting you're putting things back together like a puzzle and you're yeah. like it just makes your job a lot harder it and does. it stresses the dog out. Yeah. And so you're taking a dog that like a isn't, isn't accustomed to, or uh, used to the grooming process. B doesn't know, you know, the human that's interacting with them. And then you're putting them through an uncomfortable, um, like, uh, mm -hmm. process such as, you know, shaving a matted coat. Like that's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot of things like that. We could do an entire podcast just on matted dogs. Um, you know, so you're really like the whole thing is like, we want to set our dogs up to succeed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, putting in that little extra effort at, at when you first get your dog, whether it's a puppy or a rescue or whatever, just putting in that little extra effort to work on desensitization and, you know, socialization and getting them familiar with the other humans that they're going to have to interact with, mm -hmm. you know, it's crucial. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I won't sit here and say that like, I can groom any dog. I definitely can't. Like, I just, like what you were saying earlier, you know, with your limited and limitless people, I do have my limits. You know, I, I don't groom dogs under eight pounds. They terrify me. I'm so afraid that I'm going to, you know, I, I just, it's not right for me. And there are people out there that do that, you know, so I know my limits and I know that like, it's okay for me to say, Hey, listen, like I really enjoy working with you and I really like your dog, but I don't think I'm going to be successful with right. your dog. Here are some other professionals that I trust that I think would be better fit mm -hmm. for you. But if you never start that process with your dog, then you're never going to find those humans that mm -hmm. can work with your dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it all makes sense. So you get so let's say we bring in Abby's dog Greta. Ad, mm -hmm. Abby's dog Greta is a German Shepherd. She's about 60 pounds, but she's, again, stranger danger. Doesn't have a bite history, but is, like, who are you? Like, <laughs> yeah. she'll, you know, she'll just, like, she'll, she'll, like a wolf, she'll just, like, circle around you, you know, those types of dogs. What's your process with that? So I bring in Greta, or Abby brings in Greta to you, and she's, like, what's going on? Like, how do you, what are you, what are you looking for behaviorally? Where's that aha moment where you're, like, oh, now we're, now we click, now we're good. Like, what's your process with, like, a dog that's not terrified? Right, but incredibly unsure. Yeah. Yeah. So the first thing in a case like that is I would have you just come in for a consultation. So a lot of what 
a console is for is a reading your dog's behavior, but also reading your behavior and your energy. Um, so don't be sketchy. Right. And yeah. And like a lot of, a lot of times, and I have this problem with my own dog. He's a jerk at the vet. He's very scary at the vet. He's sounds like the same way you described Greta. Is mm -hmm. that what her name is? Um, you know, he yells and he barks and he's scary, but he's never done anything about it. So it's like a matter of reading your dog's energy. You know, are they uh, are, like the main rule is like, I never approach a dog when they walk into the shop you know, let your dog, I'll let them approach me. I make myself a little bit smaller, you know, and let them approach me. Um, and again, it's like every dog is different. So for her, I don't know. Would you start <laughs> with, what, what would be the steps like? Well, yeah, so the first step would be just a consultation. And um, I will be honest, like one of the few dog breeds that do intimidate me are German Shepherds. And I don't know why that is. I've never had, I've never been bitten by one. I've never had like a super negative experience with one. They're just so incredibly powerful and they're so, um, they're so stranger danger. They're like so, yeah, yeah, like stacks. And like, I was never scared of stacks cause he's just a big loud mouth, you know, goober. And so Stax is a perfect example. So like at first um, meeting of him, it's like, whoa, you know, he's, he's, he's barking, intense. he's intense. And then after being around him for just a few minutes, you realize his intensity is all show. It's all vocal. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's where that would start. It's like reading the dog, like, okay, are you acting this way with an intent to do something about it? Right. Are you acting this way because you're uncomfortable? Are you acting this way because you don't trust me? Are you acting this way because your mom came in absolutely terrified and, and so worked up and anxious over the situation? Um, so when that's the case, it's a matter of, okay, mom, why don't you step out of the space for a while yeah. and let me have some one-on-one -on -one time with your dog? Um, and that's where you can, I usually will just sit and like spend time with that dog. Like, we're not going to put you in the tub. We're not going to try to put you on the table. I'm not going to try to do your nails. We're just going to sit here and see if we can establish at least I can pet you. Yeah, yeah. You know? And that's kind of like once, once you kind of – I don't really know how to describe it because it's just more or less a matter of feeling. Like, once you feel that energy level, that anxiety level start to drop a little bit, whether it's because I've been able to touch you, I've been able to make a small amount of eye contact with you, <clears throat> that wasn't, you know, super intense, you know, just gentle eye contact, mm -hmm. um, whether you're, you, you know, you start to lay down or, you know, you start to approach me. Like once you can kind of see that little bit of lowering of that stress, that's when I'm like, okay, I think that we can, you know, start to work on this. Um, but when it's, you know, there's none of that and it's just like, like I will say like I, I don't do just hardcore aggressive dogs, you know, cause those are the type of dogs that like, they require just like bang, bang, boom, got to get it done, got to get it through. Um, and my shop just isn't conducive to that. Um, so it's a matter of just evaluating like that kind of behavior. Right. Because it's also about, I'm sure you having your shop and it doesn't matter the size of a shop. Same thing here. Like we have, we probably have 15 dogs in the back right now and it's crickets. Yeah. But when we do have a dog that the, sets the energy and sets the tone, I'm sure you see that too in your grooming shop. Oh, yeah. Where like a dog like Stax, Stax, for those who don't know, is uh, it's my uh, brother-in-law's shepherd that is just, he should have never went to a pet owner. He should have he should have been in the back a of a police dog. crew. Yeah, yep. 100%. Mm -hmm. But he didn't. Uh, beautiful dog. He's actually looking for home, so if anybody <laughs> knows anybody out there. Uh but he, uh, he's just a beautiful, intense dog that needs a job, and it, very few people without being in some sort of police or search and rescue group can uh, can give a dog like that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, but having one of those dogs enter, I'm sure just hi like the whole room just elevates, right? The, oh, yeah. The dogs in the kennels and the dogs on the tables and even the groomers, mm -hmm. and you're all just like things change. Yes, yeah. for sure. And so anytime we have, you know, that's where it's really important um, to communicate with your groomer. If you're a new client to somebody, um, right. don't lie to, don't lie to your groomer. So like if, you know, if you, ha if your previous groomer um, decided that they weren't the best fit for you because your dog was overly anxious or aggressive or whatever, be honest about that. Because 
that like yes that might tell another professional like you know what that's not some that's not something that I'm willing to work with and that's okay but like in my case like I will never turn down at least a consultation so mm -hmm. even if you tell me that your dog bit its last groomer okay well let's come in for a consultation oh, it's a baby. <laughs> Little baby. Um, let's set you up for a consultation um, we're going to do it either before the store opens after the store closes or on a Monday which is when I do um, that's the only day that I have the ability to do one-on-one -on -one special needs um, cases um, so we set that time where there isn't anybody else in the salon where it's just me and so that then That's I can, perfect. yeah. So then it's like, a, you don't have extra stimuli for that dog, and you don't have that super anxious dog or aggressive dog or whatever that dog's presenting. You're not escalating the entire shop. Um, so we do our best with scheduling to like try to do that. But if you don't tell us that on the phone in our initial conversation, we don't know that. Like we had someone bring a shepherd in once. They said, oh yeah, he's been groomed before. Um, we're just looking for a new groomer because we, whatever the, I don't remember what the scenario was. Oh, he loves people. He can be a little bit loud sometimes. This dog, it, this was the only time I was actually scared of a dog in my shop. He was incredibly aggressive. He was lunging over our pen doors at our staff. He was lunging at other dogs. I mean, it was like, we took every single dog off of the table out of and secured them in kennels because we didn't know if this dog was going to mm. get over the pen, through the door. We had no idea. I mean, he was just incredibly unpredictable. And, you know, we obviously called the owner right away and we're like, hey, you got to come get him. Like, this is, you know, now dangerous. given. Yeah, it's yeah. dangerous. Now, if we had known that that was how he acted ahead of time, I would have scheduled him for a, con you know, we would have gone through all the appropriate steps and we probably could have gotten him groomed. But now it's like this dog has already had this massively negative experience in our shop. So, you know, at that point, it's like, you know, undoing all of that is, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that we're on edge. And so it's just be honest, you know, be honest about your dog, know your dog and, you know, share that with your pet professionals. Yeah, because this is a waste of time. It, yeah, for sure. Like you're you do this for a living. You're gonna know immediately whether your dog has been groomed or not. Mm -hmm. Like quick. Yeah. Well, right. and there is there's definitely groomers out there, and this is what I tell all my clients. Like I don't sugarcoat a single thing. Right. Like if your dog tries to bite me, if your dog, you know, poops in its crate, if your dog cries the entire time, whatever it is, you know, I will tell you every little thing because it's important for you to know. Because not, you know, as much as I think that my clients love me so much and they're never going to leave and they're never going to go anywhere, that's just not true. They might move. They might, you know, decide they want to try a new grooming shop that opened up. And it's important for them to have that information about their dog so that they can pass it on to the next professional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we see that too, like when we do consults, majority of our clients are from out of the state. Mm -hmm. So we don't know them at all. Right. Like, it's not like, oh, well, I work with your brother, and it's like, you know, it's like we don't know anybody that come in, obviously. And and same thing with you, because you live in a, like, we live in, an, like, during the summer with the track mm -hmm. and everything. It's like you just never know. People are there for a week. People are there for the month. People are there for the summer. And, and um, it, it's interesting because, like, with us, it's the same thing where it's like, well, if you lie – or you're not telling us all of the truth, right. then you're just going to have to drive back. Mm -hmm. We've never had that because we're very particular and detailed about certain things just because we have kennel staff that are not trained on behavior. Right. And they just need to get your dog out to play or to go pee and poop. And if your dog is a threat or a danger to them, they can't be here. And if we see a little bit of it in the first 24 hours, then you have to come you back. Can so get them. Yeah. We've had those conversations with people where they'll come or, or we've had people come to do a board and train and their dog just, you know, is in heat. And we're like, we can't oh, have yeah. your dog in heat. <laughs> like people don't know though. Yeah, They don't know. They don't That's, know. They're yeah. like, why? And you have to explain to them mm -hmm. about what it's going to do to, first of all, they're not going to be the same dog they are now after their heat because they're going to act different. And, if we have an intact male in here, oh then gosh. his his training is done. Yeah. If, if you know, yeah. So it's, and some it's not even always intact males. It's it's yeah. You know, neutered males too. Yeah. You know, and even females. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it and it just it's anyway. People just don't know. Yeah, and that's it. You know, I know a lot of what you do is education, and that's a lot of what I love about um, 
being a groomer and the career is just educating people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in the like, in the groomer world, I touched on, like, the whole doodle thing earlier. You know, a lot of groomers have, you know, a lot of issues with doodles and, and the doodle clientele and things like that. And um, one of the main things is that these people that a lot of them have never even had a dog before mm. and they were at the very least they had a lab when they were growing up you know what i mean and so they see these these cute fluffy teddy bear looking things on you know social media and they're like oh i want one of those oh my neighbor down the road has one he's so great and so they get these dogs that are you know they're not purebred dogs. There, there's no regulations for their breeding. There's no. I mean, now there's finally you getting some better breeders that are doing genetic testing and things like that. Um, but they're getting these dogs that require massive amounts of grooming, massive. So like, if you are considering getting a doodle of any kind, be prepared to you know get your dog groomed every four weeks at the very least. Every month every month and it's going to cost upwards of $150, you know, so you need to budget for that and you need, and you know, breeders aren't telling people that, Oh, wait for a year till you get them groomed. So, you know, we're getting these owners that just don't know. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know I had to brush my dog. Oh, I didn't know I had to get him groomed regularly. Oh, I didn't know that, you know, all of these different things. And so I'm very grateful for my doodle clients. Like they are all, um, like when I get a new one and they're in that situation, like, oh, I didn't know. Like we just spend a lot of time communicating, educating them, showing them how to brush, giving them the tools for them to, you know, do this stuff at home if they if they are able to, if they want to. And I have amazing doodle clients. You know, they're all like very, you know, they're on good schedules. They listen to my advice. They, you know, if they don't want to brush their dog, we take them short, you know, all these different things. Um, But there's a lot of people out there that don't know this and that, you know, they want this, they have this expectation in their brain of what they want their dog to look like. And they don't understand why their dog can't look like that, Mm -hmm. you know? And so that's where it's our job as professionals to educate people. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's their job as pet owners to listen to the professionals, Mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, okay, if somebody that's been doing this for 10 years is telling you like, this is why you can't have this haircut or this is why you need to do this at home, then maybe you should just do that thing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I think also, um, well, it's, it's interesting because I, and this is, not really off topic, but it's off what we're talking about right now is I think there's a shell of grooming and there's a shell of dog training. So dog training to the general public as a shell is obedience training. Mm -hmm. It's not thresholds and boundaries and respect and behavioral work and building that relationship, et cetera. People just sit, stay, lay down. Yeah. And grooming for, for, I think as a general shell is like you said, the, the, the poodles with the, tuxedo cuts and whatever and you're like oh that's grooming but really like dog training in reality is building a relationship with your dog so your animal that you just purchased or adopted can coexist with your family long term safely Mm -hmm. and then grooming is the same thing as like keeping your dog healthy hygiene like you said before there's been times where I've picked up my dogs and you're like oh like you know something's going on with the ear or something's Mm -hmm. going on with this like you putting your hands on the dog's at least, you know, every two months or whatever is such a big piece and people just, they're like, oh, you know, like it's, it's like people, if I'm traveling or I'm doing something, they're like, so what do you do? And I'm like, I don't want to say dog trainer. Like you probably hesitate to maybe sometimes like, it's like I'm a groomer, but there's so much more to what, and that's why I was excited to have you on the podcast yeah. because there, I'm sure there, I know for a fact, there's certain groomers that are like, yeah, everything was great. Yeah. You know, they're washing. Yeah. It's like a. Well, and, you know, and, and like I can I can understand that, too, because it's like nobody wants to tell somebody that the dog's an asshole, you yeah. know, but sometimes your dog's just a jerk, mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. like this is what you need to work on. And nobody wants to say, hey, look, I know you said that you brush your dog every day, but your dog's matted. Yeah. You know, but that's where when you don't talk to people about that stuff, you're missing an educational opportunity. So, yeah, it stinks to say, hey, like, yeah, you suck at brushing your dog. Mm -hmm. But when you point out that, like, hey, you're not doing this right, let me show you how to do it. Mm -hmm. Let me give you the tools. This is the type of brush. This is the type of comb. Here's a YouTube video that shows you how to brush. Come back to my table. I will show you how to do this. You know, we're missing an opportunity to educate people by Mm -hmm. just being like, oh, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. So it's really important. It's really important to, you know. 
have a little extra balls and share that information with people. Especially from the perspective too, where your service, like you said, a lot of people are like, my dog just needs a bath Mm -hmm. and they don't expect getting a master class in X, Y, and Z. For me, it's a little bit different because that is my actual job is to be like, put your arm down, stop talking to your dog, look forward, (laughs) don't do this. Like that, I'm coaching them to handle their dog. Mm -hmm. Where like you, it's a little bit different because they're like, you just you do it and yeah. I'll pick him up when it's done. And you're like, well, if we work together, I wouldn't you wouldn't have to do so much work. Yeah. What's the worst case you've ever seen with a dog like that's come in and you were like, this is the messiest thing you've ever seen? Um, I had a guy who's like a long term client of mine and he does a lot of volunteer work in the community. Um, he's older now, so he doesn't have any of his own dogs. But he came to me a few years ago, I'll say like two or three years ago. Um, and one of the um guys that he like helps out um he went to his house he'd never like it was a new person that he started working with he went to his house and he has this little white dog and he came in he he was like in tears he's like Liz this dog is just he's like I I I, we need to help him and you know the guy doesn't drive he's elderly you know blah 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 so I'm like okay well I need him to fill out like I'm going to print out these forms for you like I need you to have him fill this stuff out you know we have we do have to have all of this but I will do whatever we can to like take care of this pup. This dog came in and he was, I'm not even sure what breed he was. The guy didn't know, probably some kind of Bichon poodle mix, little white thing, Mm -hmm. completely pelted. I mean, from like when I, so matting is one thing that's like, you know, that can be broken up, that can be brushed out sometimes if it's in like small spaces. Pelted is when every bit of that coat is just compacted and attached. So pretty much from the tip of this dog's nose through its eyes, its ears, its entire body was one solid piece. So when you're, there's a whole level of um, health issues and risks and stuff like that involved in removing a coat like that, you know, it's much easier to cut a dog. There can be underlying um, skin issues, infections already, you know, major cuts or bruising or whatever that's under there. Um, and it's, you know, it's painful to have that on your body. It's painful to remove that. Dogs can go into shock when you remove that kind of coat. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's like a whole, like I said, said earlier, that's like a whole nother podcast. But yeah, he, once I got everything off of him, got him in the bath, got a nice like massage going on him and nice like gentle shampoos and stuff, got all of his eye boogies cleared out. He was the sweetest, you know, happiest little fella. And his dad was just, it was just so sweet. His dad, you know, came in and he was crying because, you know, he didn't mean for his dog to get in that condition. He didn't have the means to get his dog to a groomer, Mm. you know, and a lot of times you see people that have, you know, mental health issues, um, income issues, things like that, where it's like there sometimes you are just trying so hard to keep yourself alive and to take care of yourself and to feed and shower yourself that you're unintentionally neglecting your pet. Mm. And that is probably one of the most difficult things in our industry is having to like differentiate between someone who just doesn't give a shit about their dog and someone that does truly care and love their dog, but their own life is struggling. Mm-hmm. And it's like, and how do you navigate that? Mm-hmm. You know? So that's, that was the worst case that I've ever had. Think like, I mean, I've heard horror stories of, you know, people like starting to shave dogs and they find maggots in their skin and uh, boat flies or whatever they're called that burrow in the skin um, I did have a dog when I was blow drying him. He had like a cyst burst on his rear end and just oh. nastiness flying everywhere. I've seen ruptured anal glands. Um, you know, so there's there's a lot that can happen. And it, do you have a do you have a breed that like for training we have the breeds that are easier? Pit bulls. My, I always tell people like pit bulls and labs. Mm-hmm. Easy I, peasy. So the easiest breeds, like hands down, always. Do you have breeds that are consistently really easy to get on the table and just breeze through? Yeah, yeah, there's definitely, you know, quite a few. I mean, Cavaliers, uh, Cavalier King Charles Spaniels are just basically little stuffed animals. (laughs) You know, they're usually really good. Most Golden Retrievers, you know, are pretty good. Um, 
like a lot of the giant breeds, honestly, like your Newfies and your St. Bernards and your Great Pyrenees, you know, as long as they aren't like two or three years old when you, the first time you bring them in, you know, a lot of them are, at least in my experience, are usually pretty cooperative for grooming. Um, for your small breeds, Havanese, they're usually pretty good. Um, usually poodles, um, not always, you know, but it's, yeah, it's kind of hard. It's really hit or right. miss because it's, you know, all, there's yeah. so many variables. Mm -hmm. but, and you, pit bulls, of course. <laughs> yeah. And pit bulls, like they, like pit bulls, boxers, Boston Terriers, Vishlas, all those dogs with like a single coat. Mm -hmm. You you don't cut, right? You just no. wash. Yep, and just bathe. Bathe in nails and ears and de-shed if they need it. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Pretty much any short-haired dog you don't cut, like labs and stuff like that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, because Thompson, my St. Bernard, he always liked going to you. Like, he always really enjoyed it just because he's probably had, like, cool water. Yeah. He was getting this. And he loved He people. loved the attention. Yeah. 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 And then, like, Lakota, she's just, she's also very, um, she just, she's smart enough. Like, she's too smart for her own good, so she knows exactly what's about to happen. But she's not aggressive, so she tolerates it. But she does want to, like, leave. So she's like, do you ever have, like, so how do you – I was wondering this the other day when I went to your shop. One of your groomers had, like, two Frenchies, and they were on, like, the thing. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you – like, do they try to jump off? And, like, how, like how – Yeah, uh, they do. Um, but, it's again, it's a matter of, like, knowing the dog on your table. And, and like, you never leave a dog unattended, unattended. on the table. Right. Um, you know, you can tell right – pretty much right away with a new dog when you put it on the table if it's going to try to get away. And, you know, so, like, um, a lot of, like, your, um, like, brachiocephalic breeds and stuff like that, you know, we don't always want to put a tether around their neck because they already have trouble breathing. Um, so you don't want to cause any, like, restriction on that. So we'll harness them across their chest. Um, and that's where, like, the our tables are great because they lower so far to the ground. Um, so when you have, like, a dog that's notorious for trying to launch itself off the table, you just lower that table to where the point, like, if they do jump or step off or whatever they're not going to be left hanging from a ground. noose yeah. you know and uh, I have to do that a lot with like really you know when I have like bigger dogs that are really nervous I'll keep the table super low so and I'll just let them step off the table and then when they say oh my feet are on the ground okay like it's not that scary and then as they get accustomed to it you can raise the table to like a more comfortable length height for yourself but, you know, it's always about the dog safety. So, you know, if it's if they're notoriously throwing their back end off the table, then that table stays Whoa. at a safe height low to the floor. Mm -hmm. um, but that's also where the groomer's help, helper comes into play, too. You know, it, it keeps it keeps them from, yes, their back end can, you know, slide off the table. But because you're standing right there, you always have a hand on that dog. You always have your eyes on that dog, even if their back end starts to, you know, go to the side of the table. You're right there to get them back on yeah 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 because i would assume like a dog like thompson that's over 100 pounds that if their rear end fell off because they're just big yeah you'd have to like try to catch him oh and yeah get him back on and it's so fun story that i don't think i ever told you the first time i groomed thompson and i we had older tables back then so they didn't go quite as low to the floor and i had a cheap like aluminum or whatever like crappy grooming arm i got him up on the table and somebody like came in the front with a dog and he was like, oh, hey, turned around, jumped off the back of my table and snapped the grooming arm. <laughs> was that when he was younger? Yeah, that was like the very first time I groomed him. Wow. So, you know, and it, as much as like, like it took just a couple of times for him, like coming in to like get on the table and be like, oh, OK, yeah, this is the table. And most of the time I just groomed him laying down. He yeah. would just lay down and I would just like do his thing. But that, those first couple of times when he was still, you know, testing my boundaries and wasn't too sure of like all the other dogs in there and all that stuff. Yeah. He Beethovened your ass. He did. <laughs> he yeah. totally did. It's like so typical Beethoven. Yeah. Just like that. I think it's in Beethoven one in the scene where he like they wrap like he, they're outside eating and he just like wraps their things and just takes off and then <laughs> the table and chair go with him. Yep. Or the, the big shake after the bath and everything yeah, is just yeah. covered in slobber and hair and water. and well, I love Tom's, and he was the best. 
Yeah, he was a legend, man. Mm-hmm. He was. He was He's still cool. my cover photo. Him and I on oh, our cool. Facebook page. It's still him. That's great. Yeah, he yeah. was a beautiful dog. I got lucky with him. I I got him, actually, from a grooming. I don't know if I ever told you that, but there was a groom. There was a groomer in like Gloversville that had had St. Bernard puppies, and I was like, oh, I'm just gonna go check him out. Mm-hmm. Of course, like I went home with one. Or, of course. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, he's he's a legend, legend dog. But it's funny because it's like when you send your kids to daycare, you're like, what do they like? Like I yeah. don't like what happens. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. All right, I'm gonna get into some more questions sure. that we have. <clears throat> so can you just use? I know the answer to this, mm-hmm. but is it bad to use human shampoo and conditioner on dogs? Yes. Okay. Yep. Because uh, humans and dogs have a different pH level. Mm. So um, just like human stuff is pH balanced for our skin, uh, canine products are pH balanced for their skin. Another side note, it's really important if you have cats or, you know, any kind of small animals that you bathe, that any products that you use are safe for them um, because it's not always the same. So, and there's definitely a level of quality when it comes to dog products. Like one thing we hear a lot is, oh, I shouldn't bathe my dog that often because it dries their skin out. Uh, when my dogs were younger, I bathed them every week, you know, their pipples, and I would bathe them every week, and their skin never got dry. So it's about the quality and type of product that you're using. So if you go to Walmart and you buy Hearts shampoo, please don't do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's just so many better and similarly priced options that you can do. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, please don't. If And if, if you absolutely have to use something that's not dog shampoo on your dog, like say your dog gets sprayed by a skunk or something like that, and I can't believe I'm even saying this, and groomers across the country are going to punch me right in the face, just use a little bit of Dawn dish soap, Mm -hmm. just a little bit diluted. And that's really the safest thing that you can use if you absolutely don't have dog shampoo, can't get to dog shampoo, can't get to a a salon. So, like, yeah, you're not going to kill your dog if you bathe it in Pantene. Mm -hmm. Um, But preferably, no, don't do that. uh, Side note, too, because this was a thing that comes up often is, like, I don't know who they are, but we always say they, right? They say that <laughs> if you groom your dog too much or you wash your dog too much, it'll take away all their natural oils. Mm-hmm. Yep, that that's true. I mean, yeah, that's true. And again, it it depends on like the products that you use. Um, so no, you shouldn't bathe your dog every single day. Um, and some dogs shouldn't be bathed every week. Um, you know, again, it's knowing your dog. Um, I can't say that we have any that come in um, with us that have any issues like that where like, you know, over bathing or over grooming has been a problem. Again, if you're using high quality stuff, you're not, yes, you are removing excess oil, but you're not stripping oil. We also use conditioners and things like that. So just like with our skin, if you just wash your face and you don't replace that barrier or replace that moisture, then your skin starts to overproduce oil. So, you know, it's just finding that balance. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that makes sense because when you wash your face after like a shower or something and your skin's like super tight and Mm -hmm. then you put moisture on. It's like, ah. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) It's the same thing. Uh, So one other question we had on Instagram was, what is the best way for somebody that's listening, watching to choose a a dog groomer? Like what should they, what should people be looking for? Mm -hmm. What questions should they be asking? What are some red flags in your industry that you would say? Um, always, always ask for a consultation. Um, I would say if you're calling a new groomer and they aren't willing to do like a free consultation, um, to me, that's a red flag unless they have like some like, like crazy scheduling or something like that where they, their place doesn't allow for that. Um, and really it's just a matter of, again, knowing your dog. Um, so if you, you know, there's a grooming salon out there for every type of dog. And if your dog is, you know, intimidated by other dogs, then I wouldn't take them to a place like PetSmart or Petco or, you know, some of the bigger grooming salons. I would try to find somebody that is, you know, like we only have myself and one other groomer and an assistant, you know, or find a place that's a one-on-one. And so really just call like and don't just call one place and you know settle with that reading reviews is always good um but also be wary that there's always that one or you know even on a perfectly good you know amazing groomer they might have some one wackadoo 
Oh, got ticked off at them and left a bad always. review. So, you know, yeah, always. If anybody has like a 5.0 on anything, yeah. you know it's not real. Right. <laughs> like a 4.7 and a 4.9 are yeah. like great normal businesses. You're always going to have that one or that two. One person. Just... Like, we had a bad review that somebody worked with us in like 2000 and like, it was like five years ago. Yeah. And they just left a bad review like last month. And Taylor was like, what the heck? What the <laughs> hell? Yeah. People are so bizarre. But like being a consumer of anything, like you and I, like if we check out, like you know, if we're traveling, like you in New Jersey, and you mm-hmm. check out this like restaurant, and it has like one bad re- one star of like somebody saying like, well, I thought the tablecloths were gonna be white and they right. were black, so <laughs> therefore it ruined one everything. Star. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I have one one star review, and there's no. Um, it was a, it was a client of ours. There's no explanation of why. Like it was kind of the same scenario. We hadn't seen them in a couple of years, and all of a sudden at like two in the morning, I got a one star review, and I was like, "What the heck?" Sometimes <laughs> Where did this come from. <laughs> sometimes too, though. Sometimes too. I've also seen particularly like older people. That's yeah. They don't even know that they did it. They were just like on their phone looking at your thing and like wanted to call you, and they got into this tab, yeah, and like, they didn't the even heck? realize they that even they didn't even realize. Yeah, like on Facebook, you can easily do that, or on Google. Mm-hmm. Um, but I always tell people that if you're successful in anything that you do, and you don't have like between a 4.5 to like a 4.9, like you you just you're not taking enough clients yeah. because there's going to be like the craziest stuff like ever there's well, the o- big thing to like as a consumer and and this is also to other business owners too i mean as a consumer read how the owners respond to negative reviews and that was something that i learned just over the last couple of years i mean you should respond to negative reviews unless they're just totally off the wall bonkers and the review Mm -hmm. speaks for itself but it gives you an opportunity like you're not responding to that negative review to respond to that person you're responding to it for any potential customers because then they get to see your character they get to see how you respond to conflict they get to see how you resolve conflict it gives you the opportunity to also say okay well you know that's like not exactly how or however you want to handle it, mm-hmm. you know. So that's what I was like. If you read, if you read reviews and you see a couple negative ones, look at how the owners responded True. to it. Um, if they were, you know, that's just kind of like human True. behavior or whatever. But yeah, I would say like making sure that you know they are willing to do a consult. Um, I know for me personally, like having. Um, policies and procedures in place. Like you know, we have a whole new client form. We have a whole intake form. You know, we have. We, we have you sign stuff, you know, so that we know that you are making a commitment to us. This is our commitment to you. Right. Um, so I think that's important. And I know not everybody does that, and that's okay. But for me personally, you know, I want, like, I don't ever have a problem signing, a, like, a new client agreement or a contract and providing my information. I would kind of, like, steer away from somebody that says, oh, I just need your name and phone number. Just come on in. We'll, yeah. We'll, yeah. I don't care your dog's name or... Yeah, exactly. Or or I don't need your rabies or your vet information, you know. So for me, like that, I think that's important. Um, And just honestly, like trust your own energy and and your own, you know, like that's why an in-person consult I think is important because, you know, you can walk in and, and really get a good read on somebody most of the time by having a conversation with them face to face. And is, is like free consults the norm in the grooming space? I, I think so, um, but, you know, I won't speak right. for, you know, across the industry, but, right. you know, I, I think it is because it's usually, you know, a 10, 15 minute thing. So. What, um, what advice would you have? Because one thing when we were in London this last year doing a seminar, we had a lot of groomers, like 10 of the audit spots were groomers. Like they were like, because they wanted to learn more about behavior. Mm-hmm. I didn't, like once one groomer came up and she had like these Portuguese water dogs. Oh boy. Yeah. And they, they were all groomed up, like all fancy and it was cool, mm-hmm. you know, and she had them and, uh, I was talking to her and she was just like, and then like two or three other groomers came up and they were like, it was great to watch you break down behavior. But they said one of the biggest reasons why we came to the seminar, because it has nothing to do with grooming right. at all, is they really wanted to know how I worked with clients Mm -hmm. as they were saying I paid to like some of them flew in from different places in in the UK 
to do this seminar and they were like, we came here because we have a hard time, mm-hmm. like you were just saying, saying things to clients that may be uncomfortable or that they don't really want to hear. And so the groomers that had came, come to my seminar were like, it was so cool to see how you took, and and that's the interesting thing about doing seminar in general is you have to work with a dog a dog owner that you've never met before with a dog you've never met in front of 70 to 100 people yeah. in a small space and in some cases in a different country and a completely different time zone mm-hmm. right and it's so hard to do but what what it does is there's a dog that's in front of you that is having problems 95% of the time because the dog owners are doing something terribly wrong mm-hmm. and what they found most beneficial was how I how I help the owner help themselves without making them feel silly. Yes. So with you, mm-hmm. same thing. Mm-hmm. Is somebody comes in and they're like, I didn't know I had to, you know, yeah. wash my dog or do their nails or do the ears or yeah. whatever. Yeah. I mean it's it's all comes down to like being respectful and and being knowledgeable and being compassionate. So I think a lot of times a a lot of times we as groomers feel like we aren't taken as seriously as maybe some of the other like canine professionals, you know, because we just groom dogs all day. Um, so it's knowing and respecting yourself and knowing that like you are a professional. You know, it's like what you said to me when I came in. I was like, oh, I'm so nervous. You're like, you're the professional. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you are the professional. You do this every day, mm-hmm. you know. And if there is a topic that you aren't, you know, super confident in, like whether it's double-coated dogs or um, a certain haircut or a certain breed tip, educate yourself. Mm-hmm. And it's okay to say, you know what, I don't know the answer to that but let me research that for you, you know? So it's okay to be honest about that. And it's just, for me, it just comes from a place of being, you know, I've always been fairly straightforward. Um, So it just comes from a place of being confident in my own knowledge and knowing that the reason why I'm telling this person this isn't because I want to hurt their feelings. It isn't because I want to seem like I'm smarter or better than them. It's because I want what's best for their dog. Mm -hmm. And that's why we are in this industry is because we want to help pets. We want to help dogs and we want to help owners help their dogs. And when you can put it in a way to them like that, where it's like, I'm not telling you that you're doing something wrong because I want to make you feel stupid. Right. It's like, I want, I want what's best for your dog. So in my professional experience, here's this, this, and this. And not just being, not just telling them, not just throwing like a bunch of words or criticisms or instructions at them, but then spending the time to explain it in detail or, you know, give them the tool, like, how many times I go back to my toolbox and bring out my brushes or I bring out my combs or my scissors or whatever tools that I use on their dogs and I show them, Mm -hmm. you know, how, how to do it or, you know, what I use. Yeah. So I really, and then just having respect for that person. It's like, you know, when you go get your car fixed, I don't know anything about cars, Mm -hmm. you know, and like my mechanics like, Oh, you know, you put WD 40 in the two, seven, whatever, you know, it's like, I feel dumb, you know, but you shouldn't feel dumb because you don't work on cars, you know? So to any pet parents out there that are listening, it's like, don't feel dumb when your groomer says, Oh, you know what? You shouldn't do this. You should use that, whatever. It's not, it, you don't do this every day. Mm -hmm. We do this every day and it's our job to educate you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, yeah, just having that respect and compassion and confidence Mm -hmm. to share those things. Yeah, I think that's a natural, and that's why you're so good at what you do is because you, that does come across and you do care, Mm -hmm. you know, like the fact that you got teary-eyed seeing a dog that, (laughs) you know, my dog that you used to groom just shows like indefinitely how much you care about what you do and you can, you're somebody that we can trust uh, with our dogs, whether you can do a good job or not, at least at the end of the day, you're going to say like, no, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But that's how I got it, got started into dog training. And I still like hesitate to call myself a trainer because I'm really a people trainer, Mm -hmm. you know, but I I did the same thing as I I saw people struggling with their dogs. And I was like, I can, let me just show you how to do that really quick. And people are like, whoa, whoa. And they're like, that's dog training. I'm like, I'm not a dog. That's dog training. I'm not a dog trainer. That's dog training. I'm not a dog trainer. I was like, I can just, like you, like you can just 
do something and you've, and then you go to conferences and you go to seminars and you watch videos and you get experience and you get better and you sharpen your tools. And before you know it, you're like, I can do a lot with these yeah. dogs. And yeah, it's, it's an interesting, so anybody out there that's wanting to become a groomer, mm -hmm. anybody that's a groomer now that it's maybe struggling with anything in the industry, uh, I'm sure like one of the biggest things for you guys is, is probably mental fatigue as it is in any other business that has to do with your heart, your, your love, your passion. Uh, some people don't, you know, they don't make enough money to pay their bills, but they do what they love because they love it. And they're struggling with that balance. What would be some pieces of advice for those individuals? Boundaries, yeah. set your boundaries. That was my last year was my year of establishing professional boundaries and personal boundaries. And, you know, we are, we've had this like constant, you know, the customer is always right kind of mentality for so many years. And especially when it comes to a customer that has a living thing that you're responsible for. Um, and frankly, that's not always the case. So setting, like if your schedule is Tuesday through Saturday, eight to four, then your schedule is Tuesday through Saturday, eight to four. Mm -hmm. that, do that doesn't mean you can't, you know, when you're, you know, one of your top tier clients that you just love, you know, they had something come up and they need to reschedule and you want to fit them in somewhere. Yes, of course you can do that. But I spent pretty much the majority of my career up until the last couple of years, just burning myself out because I didn't want to say no to people mm -hmm. because, Oh, well, I really need to get my dog in. And as much as like grooming is, such an important thing it's it's important for their health it's important for all these things your dog's not going to drop dead if it doesn't get groomed by saturday mm -hmm. you know so setting those boundaries and and you know kind of like training your clients like you attract the clients that you want and you you know you can you can basically train your clients by saying okay like this is how you know with doodles we require you to be on this schedule if you your dog gets a haircut we require a minimum of this amount of weeks we require you to pre-book your appointments um so having those boundaries set and having policies in place like mm -hmm. that wasn't an, and i've always been kind of like a lee -de 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 -de, like free-spirited you know kind of girl and then I realized that because I had no boundaries and I had no, you know, regulations in just my life in general, I couldn't be that free spirited person because I was constantly like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm doing too much over here and oh, I'm, that person's not happy with me and blah, 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 blah. And like, wait a minute, slow down for a second. Here's what I'm willing to tolerate. Here's what my lifestyle will allow. And here's what it won't. Mm -hmm. And since I've put some, you know, very specific policies into place, like, our, our shop runs so much smoother. We have less no call, no shows. We have less cancellations. Um, you know, it, it just having those boundaries is crucial mm -hmm. and take some friggin time off. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> take a long weekend every, you know, once a month, take like rearrange your schedule. That's how I have my schedule now. So I, I have it alternated where I get at least one long weekend a month. And even if I don't go do anything during that time, even if I just sit at home or just catch up on my housework, whatever. I have that to look forward to. So just maintaining that, keep your schedule what it is. If you're a business owner, don't take your work phone home with you. Mm. You know, before there were cell phones, we had landlines. So if an office was open from eight to five, you could only call from eight to five. Mm -hmm. And that like when I first took, you know, took on my own business, I would answer people's phone calls and text message at nine o'clock at night at six o'clock in the morning. I'm like, what the heck am I doing? Mm -hmm. Like, set those boundaries, have office hours, have regular hours, you know, accept what you can and can't do. Yeah. That's hard. Go get a massage. Yeah. Please go get a massage. Yeah. <laughs> That's hard for a lot of people. It is. Because they care and they want to succeed so bad. And some people also need to succeed in order to live. Mm -hmm. So not answering that text not sending that email back or whatever sometimes can be the difference between you making your rent or not. And so I think just making sure that you're organized enough yes. and having delegation was really big for me in my scale of what I do because, you know, interesting enough, you know, like, I, like I'm not a, like, I don't like, you can't hire me. Right. You know what I mean? Like, like you're like, oh, I want you to train my dog. Like, it's very, like, 
with my schedule and with what I do and my structure of my career right now, like I'm, I don't like, I'm a content creator around the dog space because I want to do education about what I love, mm -hmm. which is why we're here. But I train very off or very so often. And so delegation was a big part of that scale to be able to do something like this. Like, um, so anyway, so like on top of what you were saying about your boundaries mm -hmm. of, because one thing that I'll reinforce with what you're saying is, is the reason why it's important for you to have boundaries for, for any business owner is if you get burnt out, you can't help anybody. Right. So if you, you can't if you, pour from an empty cup. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I also am, am like that. And I think a lot of, even like, this is at a different scale, of course, but anybody that finds success will have a hard time growing because we're, we are, I would say, empathetic, compassionate people. And we're like, yes, men and women, where we're like, yeah, I can help, I can help, I can mm -hmm. help. But you can't run your business like that at scale because you'll burn out yep. and you'll get burnt. Like I've like the amount of times I've been burnt by people and the amount of money I've wasted and invested and in whatever, mm -hmm. uh, learning from those mistakes. And I think it's important for anybody out there to know that if you make a mistake, it's okay. Yes. But taking that mistake and then learning from it is the only way that that's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. If you continue to make those mistakes, then it's not okay. And you're just, you're going to go down a hole and it's going to suck. Yeah. Yeah. But the delegation of being a small business owner and the space that we're in where, cause at the end of the day, in our heads, what we think is, is if we don't answer X, Y, and Z emails, phone calls, text messages, then the dog is going to suffer. Mm -hmm. And it, we talked my, my friend, Will and I talked about this in the last podcast. One of the hardest things with what him and I do in particular is similar to what you do is people will play the blame game. Yes. <laughs> where they're like, well, you know, yeah. shaggy, really is having a really itchy or really mad at and you're like you don't you can't do that to yeah. some you know because we see that all the time like if you don't answer me my dog's gonna get put down or you know whatever yeah it, it, they throw that and that's why like you can't I've noticed that and in order for me to grow I have like every person such as yourself Abby everyone we have bandwidth of what we can do mm -hmm. and if you clog your bandwidth, every human has like a bandwidth of what they can do throughout the day and throughout the month and throughout the year. And if you clog that with things that you can't control and things that you can't help, then you're not going to ever, you're just going to stay stagnant. Yeah. You're not going to be able to actually grab a gear and help then more people or focus on what you're doing. So it's important to do what, what you're saying because being in this industry is you want to help, you want to help, you want to help, and you feel bad. And there's even going to be clients that are going to make you feel bad. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you want, you'll you find a way to make it all work. But again, like it's important to do what you said because you'll get burnout really quick. And once you burn out of something you love, life becomes very hard. Yes, it does. Because you can't enter that area again in your head because you're like, I want to do what I love, but because I had these experiences, now what I love is not what I love anymore, right. and now you have nothing. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of it's it's the in the vet somebody one of my staff was saying this the other day that like one of the biggest professions for suicide is veterinarians. Yeah, yeah, I've read that before, and I'm sure it has to do with similar things mm -hmm. with they are you have to fix this or my dog will literally die or whatever. Or I mean, like just the amount of dogs that do die. Mm -hmm. I know for me, like that, you know, cause I was interested in veterinary medicine when I was younger. I'm like, I would have a hard time dealing with the owners that, right. You know, you tell them that this thing is wrong with their dog and they're like, eh. mm -hmm. you know, and I, like, I, I love vets and <laughs> I am the first groomer in the world to be like, take your dog to the vet. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we get a lot of people that, you know, ask advice like, oh, well, what do you think this is? I don't know. I'm not a vet. Mm -hmm. Like, take your dog to the vet. And I think that's where, like, in their industry, as much as they are so, they're so highly respected because of all of their schooling and whatnot, they're also so 
um, underappreciated, you know, for what they do, like, you know, how many dogs they see in a day. And, you know, you think about like a medical doctor, there's not a single medical doctor out there that's a dentist, a surgeon, an esthetician, a dermatologist, you know, a a urinal, whatever, you know, a proctologist. Vets literally do all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, they cover all of that. So we need to give our vets way more respect than we do. And it's not even, see, a lot of people don't realize that the small um, like s- small animal vets, like your pets, it's not just dogs, it's cats, yeah. it's cats. ferrets, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's everything. And, and, and I agree. And, and I think it's, it's tough for people in the industry because we, nobody goes through that much education or nobody goes through the amount of hell that you and I have gone through in our careers to get to where we're at because we're in it for the money. Right. You know, it's because we love what we do. Mm-hmm. And if we didn't love what we do, and you can, but I will say that you can see very quickly and very clearly the people who are in it for the money mm-hmm. because things are set up entirely differently. Yeah. And I've been asked to do some pretty wild stuff for people who are like that, where they're like, I have a, I have a shit ton of money and I want to open up X, Y, and Z, but I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I want I want to pay you to come in and create these things, and I'm like, if if the person at the top, they don't know something, that's fine. Right. But if they don't care, don't care, yeah, it's not yeah. gonna work. Yeah, there's a there's a big like issue with that in the grooming industry is people opening up because I mean there's a massive need for groomers right now, and so you know people see that oh that's a uh, you know a money thing, and so people that don't know anything about grooming they just want to make money off of it will open grooming shops. Well, you don't. You have no knowledge or care. You know, you have no business being in any kind of animal care or human care, you know, industry if you don't actually care for mm-hmm. what you're doing. Unless they hire somebody like you to come right, in. Someone and- that's, you know, like, oh, here, I will give you the money. I will create this yes. thing. Now, somebody that does care. Yes. But that, that also, I mean, that just means that that person actually cares. It's a matter of them not right. knowing but they care enough to bring in a professional that knows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough uh, and I and I'm and it's it's uh kind of refreshing and good to hear that you deal with the same stuff everyone else does. And same thing with vets, like we have we have some vets that lined up for the podcast that we'll have on and it'll be, you know, the same thing and it's interesting. My cousin, my first cousin is a she's an exotic oh wow. vet in a specialty in Avion and so she does Everything from lions, tigers, bears, wolves, ostriches. That's um, amazing. Tortoises. Yeah, it's really cool. She, um, she's she's great, and uh, I just spent some time with her recently. She's one of the head vets at a big veterinary school uh, down south, and we were talking about how. It, but it's cool because they. I think there's just so many different, like, I think we can, it's easy for us to get into like this kind of darker space where we're always looking about like what's bad and what's not. And then Mm -hmm. we come out, but like I was touring their campus and they have like all the, like they have so much cool stuff going on. And it, the, it's just, I think when you love animals, you're just a certain type of person and it's important for people uh, to f- you know, going back to people who are inspired to maybe do something in mm-hmm. in our paths of working with dogs to just take it slow yeah. and know that you're gonna have good clients and you're gonna have bad clients. Are there any educations or classes or courses or schools that you have found to be helpful or that you would recommend for anybody that is interested in becoming a groomer or is a groomer that wants to get more education? I mean, there is a school in Clifton Park um, for grooming. I believe it's called like the Pink Pet Parlor. Or was, I can't remember the name of it. Um, that's the only local school mm-hmm. um, that I know of. Um, honestly, like social media is such a huge resource now. So there are so many, um, like some of my favorite, and they're like old school groomers that s- they still do, you know, education are Jay Scruggs and Sue Zecco. Um, they have, you know, they have like this, it's called super styling session. So they have Instagram and they've got, you know, videos up on there. I mean, Instagram is a huge, huge tool um, just for finding those people. And honestly, for me, like for learning, that's the way I learn best. Like I'm not a good classroom person, even though I went to the convention, 
Like, I'm not a good classroom person. I'm not, like, a reading person. Like, I like to interact with people. I like to learn that way. I like to see what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, like, that's that's a good place to start is, like, just get on Instagram and, and search some of these places. Um, there's, you know, bigger companies like Barclay Productions. That's who through uh, Intergroom, which was the convention. You know, you can go to, like, their Instagram and see all the people that they sponsor right. and all the stylists that they sponsor. Um, if you have a certain, like, brand of shears that you like to use, like, I like Kenshi. You know, there's groomers that, you know, are in the show ring that use Kenshi, and you can go to their Instagram pages, and you can see, you know, the stuff that they do. So, for me, that's, like, a huge resource. I mean, yeah. as much as it's, like, a lot of reels and a lot of bullshit on there, you know, sure. you also can find a lot of really good resources. And just, you know, if you know what it is that you like to do in the industry, you know, Find other people that do that better than you. Yep. And follow them. And I know there's other like certificate programs and classes and stuff that you can take. Like there's the whole National Dog Grooming Association of America. You can go through their whole certification process. Um, you know, that's a whole nother level of of yep. logistics and stuff like that. But Yeah, I think to go back on what you were saying about like how you learn. I also am like that. Mm -hmm. So I think that, I think first of all, every human on the planet has something that they should be doing or that they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, however you want to, yeah. Calling. Yeah. Yeah. Purpose or a calling, however you want to look at that. If you want to look at, at it religiously or universally or whatever, I think, I don't think we're all just supposed to be here to mm -hmm. just be here. Right. Like, I, I just think that we all have some something in us that then allows us to, it feels good. Like mm -hmm. when I work, like when, when I do what I do, I, I'm excited to, I was ex on a Sunday, I'm excited to come to work and yeah. talk to you. And same thing, like I get excited to like get in dogs that I can help and things like that. And I think, um, education is really important, but there's, there's like traditional education and then there's other types of education. And I think some people like you and I will feel a certain way about, well, I really didn't pay much attention in school, mm -hmm. but, uh, I, you know, I learned so much better this way. And, and, and that was me in school too. I was a C plus type of student. Uh, I was friends with all my teachers and it, I had a beautiful relationship. I had a lot of empathy when I was very young and I just, I just loved everybody and I was, you know, I was in school, but I didn't learn anything that right. I could use today. Really. I yeah. learned how to be social and I learned how to communicate with others. And I had, I have friends that are going to be forever friends, but I, I just, I guess my point is, is, um, we had this conversation just the other day or the other podcast about like going to school and getting that education. And I think there's certain people that should go down that route mm -hmm. because they don't have that gift or that innateness that no, like however you want to look at it, God been like, this is what you're going to be good right. at. And there's certain people that can take that and then go, nobody else can do this but me or whatever and then they go out and get education and then they they build on top of it and they make it better mm -hmm. like any type of like all of our musicians like yeah some of them went to school but a lot of them didn't right same thing with the good chefs uh, you know like guy fury is a perfect example like they're not going to sit down at his restaurant and be like well this guy doesn't have a plaque on the wall so yeah so we're not gonna eat. i don't want his cheeseburger yeah. <laughs> like no like it's yeah. good if it's good it's good right and so anyway i think that that's str that's a struggle for a lot of people because mm -hmm. maybe they can't afford education but they're really good at something and i think one of the coolest things now with social media is people being able to show that yeah like they can, you know, pick up a guitar and just rip. Mm -hmm. And you're like, what? Wow, yeah. that's great. And, then, and they're like 12 and they've yeah. never done school. They just have this gift mm -hmm. and they just ripped on it and it's cool or like just creators in general. Anyway, I just wanted to touch on that because there's like this imposter syndrome that comes with education and how people learn. And like I said before, I want my surgeon to go to school. Right. And I want my dentist to go to, go to like, school. But there's certain things that, are in the service industry of people being really good at craft artistry mm -hmm. that uh, don't necessarily require traditional roadmaps of paying $150,000 a year to get an education from. I think that we're in a different space now in a different place where if you're really good at something innately and naturally, and then you build on top of it responsibly, you can still be more successful than somebody with a degree in the wall. Yeah. And not. the, the, 
kind of a catch-22 with our industry is there's no regulation, which right. is good in some ways, but overall it just means like you literally could go pick up a pair of clippers and become a dog groomer mm-hmm. with no training, with no education. Um, I think it's like to touch kind of on what you were saying, you can go to school and get a degree and learn how to do something, but if it's not something that you're passionate about, if it's not something that you love, that you care mm-hmm. about, then you're missing that entire piece of it. So I do think it's important if you are somebody that is interested in grooming that you, um, you know, find a shop that, you know, is, has trained groomers before. Like you can shadow them. Yeah. You can shadow, you can be an apprentice, you can learn, you know, there are people that do that. I mean, that's how I learned. Um, or that, like I said, there are schools throughout the country that, you know, you just have to, I don't know all of them. (laughs) You you just have to get on Google and and look. Um, but most successful groomers, in my opinion, have, you know, just learned in the job, you know, and it's because, you know, they are, passionate for what they want to do and you know when that's like you're like this is what I want to do I'm going to do whatever it takes to learn how to do this and to get good at it you know then you are going to do all the hands-on stuff you are going to on top of that get online and take you know online classes you are going to go on social media and find people that are that are really good at what they do and and learn from them you know so it's a matter of like using all of those resources that are that are there for you yeah I think it all comes full circle if you can do it all that's you know that's that's where the that's where the magic happens yeah is where if you go out and you and this i think this goes for anything outside of doctors and surgeons who like it's different that's that's a different right. thing yeah like, where you do need a lot of the education before you even cut somebody open like <laughs> yeah. as a complete it's not like making a cocktail or right you know grooming a dog it's like if you go in and you practice and you learn from somebody like say somebody's been doing it professionally for 45 years and they're they're amazing at it and they should be after that long right mm-hmm. and you're learning step by step everything that they do how they do it and then you also have this natural you know because I've I do the same thing like I work with dog trainers all the time and some people have it same thing with dog owners yeah some people have it and some people, some people don't. don't. And I can't teach the people who don't have have it ha- how to have it. Right. You just can't do that. You can't. It's yep. like anything else with like music's a good way, like rhythm and just being, just having like some sort of music in you, right? right. Some sort of that. It's like it's hard to, t- dancing. Like yeah. There's people who can dance and there's people who can't. Like And like there's people who like can't dance but want to and they can like kind of dance you know that's me like right. that's <laughs> and, most people yeah I can get out there and like make a fool out of myself I don't really care I'm having fun <laughs> yeah but then there's I'm not people, winning any contests <laughs> yeah and then there's just people who just have this like crazy rhythmic yeah natural pop stuff and you're like how, how you do just, you do that and you feel it right yeah. like they just feel it and they just know like what to do and how their face is and where their body is mm-hmm. and it's this beautiful chemistry that happens and we like I said we can talk about how how a bunch of other things in the world are like that yeah. like again like I'm just envisioning like Jimi Hendrix putting up a guitar for the first time or like Jimmy Plant or any any type of like art that we've all like loved or grown to love like mm-hmm. that was there's just like when people just it just like the, yeah, the universe yeah. <laughs> it's just like perfect yep and then there's other people who you know want to get in it too more traditionally so anyway so we always say like do everything like yeah. go get education take courses go through a school and then go in shadow and and mm-hmm. whatever but it, it, to each his own really on on that yeah again it, it comes back to like whatever your learning style is mm-hmm. you know yeah, because I, I don't, like, I have ADHD, and if mm-hmm. I don't, if I'm not interested in, like, if the, I'm like, I'm like, I was, like, TikTok would have been really bad for me if I was in high school, yeah. like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm the type of person that, like, if the guy in front of me is not dancing on four legs and talking about something I really care about, I'm going to be thinking about what I'm going to be doing after school mm-hmm. or whatever, and so I have to be, like, super engaged with things. Same. Um, nail, so nail trimming tips. So this is probably, again, very generalized. Mm-hmm. But do you have any, other than desensitizing dogs to nail trimmers and yeah. dremels and things? I mean, as far as, like, doing their nails at home, like, for, you know, if somebody wants to do their own dog's nails, um, you know, make sure you have, A, make sure you have canine or, you know, like, actual dog clippers. Like, please don't use your toenail clippers. <laughs> um, and... You know, there's there's a lot of um, 
resources online and even like on my Facebook um, back during COVID, I did a nail trim video because um, at that point in time, like we were shut down for a while, so people right. couldn't, you know, bring their dogs in. So I did a nail trim video. Um, you know, so it's like, you know, make sure you have good quality clippers, uh, make sure they're, you know, sharp enough. And then um, there's a whole like science between, you know, the nail. There's a there's actually a vein that grows into the nail called the quick, and that vein also has nerves in it. So if you cut the dog's nail back past that it causes pain and it causes like a lot of bleeding, like a dramatic amount of bleeding. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you have a dog that has white nails, it's a lot easier cause you can actually see kind of that pink, that like color, you know, change in there. If you have a dog with dark nails, it's a little harder. Like there's things that you can look for. Um, now does the, that grow? The quick grow it does. with the yep. nail. Okay. Yep. So if your dog's nails are really long, you aren't going to, most of the time, you're not going to be able to cut a whole bunch of that off because a good amount of that is going to be the quick. So in order to get that back, like I would definitely say, if your dog's nails are really long, please don't try to cut them at home. Bring them to a professional, whether it's a groomer or a vet or, you know, somebody that knows what they're doing. Um, because at that point, you have to cut it back just to the quick. And this is where the Dremel tool comes in handy because you can get it back a little bit farther. And then as that nail, that quick will start to recede. And then as the nail grows, then you can cut more back. And so it's a process of, you know, trimming your dog's nails every two to three weeks mm. to get that quick to recede. Um, but, yeah, that's a big thing is, like, don't just, like, look at your dog's nails and say, oh, they're long, and, mm. you know, cut a big chunk off because you're going to have a – very upset dog and, you know, blood all over everything. Yeah. But if you do accidentally cut your dog's nails too short or if your groomer does, it happens. Even we do it. You know, sometimes it's especially in a dog with black nails. If your dog, you know, dogs move all the time. Your dog moves just mm -hmm. as you quick the, you know, quick the clippers and you go a little too short. Um, they make stuff called Quick Stop, which is a like a blood clotting powder, which most people don't have at home. Um, but if you have cornstarch on hand, you can put cornstarch on it, and that'll help to stop the bleeding. Or like we just had one happen the other day, and you know, I told the owner, I said it's you know if it's very minor, but if she goes out and like walks on the pavement, it could reopen. And so if you if your dog's nail gets quicked at the groomer at the vet, try to keep them off the pavement for a little while until they naturally can you know. Mm -hmm. scab that over um and then again if it does break open you can put cornstarch on it and that'll help and it, it's not painful you know it doesn't sting to put the cornstarch on or at the very least flour will work too mm. yeah because that sucks when that happens thompson yeah. that's why you got to trim your dog's nails because yeah. once they get long and they get caught in something oh it's so yeah painful. like thompson did that one time he jumped out of the truck and it he, snapped. yeah snapped it off and it was bleeding everywhere mm -hmm. it was yeah, and, and especially when they break like that, then the quick is actually exposed. exposed. And it hurts. Yeah, it's very sensitive, and it hurts. It can get infected. You know, so nail health. And the other thing with nails, too, is when the nails get too long, it actually changes the way, like, your dog's anatomy. So it yes. changes the way their paws yes. hit the ground, which then changes the way their, you know, legs move. It changes the pressure on their joints. Um, so it's really important to have them, you know, at a healthy... And there's a lot of resources online um, that you can look up to show, like, proper nail length and things like that. Um, so, yeah, getting on, um, you know, a regular... Like, if anything, if your dog doesn't need anything else but nails, you know, get on a regular schedule with a groomer for that. It's usually much a bit more affordable than a vet because you don't have to pay for like an office visit fee and all that stuff. Um, you know, and it's also another really good way to get your dog used to going to the groomer because it's a short visit so yeah. it's in and out, you know, like for us, like we, you know, we don't do any walk-in appointments, but you know, your nail appointments are a 10 minute tops, you know, event, you bring your dog in, you wait outside, come back in and grab them, go next door, get a cup of coffee, whatever. And then it's, you know, just another way for them to be socialized too. Yeah, there was, I was looking up this video, this this girl did this video, and it was amazing. I was watching, trying to find her name. I, I, it was unbelievable, This the information that this lady had on just trimming nails. Yeah. And she was going over how the nail trimming can affect your dog's back and their mm -hmm. neck and how long they live and the arthritis and, mm -hmm. and they have to go to chiropractors and it's crazy yeah. what they do to stay off their nails because it's painful or it's they're curling back. Yeah, that's really like bad. some so like a lot of dogs their nails grow out. Some dogs their nails 
grow actually curled and they'll grow under. I've had um, dogs where it's actually grown into their pad. And yeah, so you have really to cut does. it. I mean, that's, yeah, that's a big problem. And then you it leads to infection and, you know, all sorts of other mm-hmm. things. So just get your dog's nails trimmed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Groom <laughs> your dog. a lot yeah. of problems. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, I think we covered a lot of stuff. Is there anything that you want to put out there to the world about what you do? Or if there's any other advice, last minute, final send offs to people who mm-hmm. are listening? I think the big thing is, you know, have have patience and compassion for your groomer. Um, we are all, our industry as a whole, we are dealing with a lot of burnout and we are short-staffed and we want to do the best job we possibly can for you and your, and your pet. And, you know, communication, like really communicate with us and, you know, just get on that regular schedule. Mm-hmm. Like, get your dog groomed regularly, especially if you have a doodle um, with that thick curly hair and that beautiful teddy bear face and all of that. Um, Make sure you're on a regular schedule and, you know, you communicate with your groomer. And just, like, remember, too, you know, like, if we go get a haircut, like, you know, I got this crazy bang situation going on. This was, like, you know, I told somebody what I wanted. It was an image I had in my head. And then she did what she thought that I explained, you know, so it's, well, and full disclosure, I also trim them myself first. That's another thing, moms and dads at home, please stop trimming your own dogs. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, communication is key. And, you know, if you have a certain specific look that you want for your pup, find a picture on Instagram, show us a picture. Um, we may or may not be able to accomplish that based on your dog's breed, your dog's coat, you know, your dog's condition, your dog's behavior, but we can at least, you know, know what it is that you're thinking in your brain of what you want. So have, uh, have patience and compassion for us and communicate, really just communicate because we want what's best for your dog and we also want what's best for you. You know, we want you to be happy. Mm -hmm. So Great. And get your dog's nails trimmed. Yeah. <laughs> start young, start early. Yes, and definitely start early. You know, get those get those puppies in right away, um, you know, as soon as they have the rabies. Again, that's probably different state to state. But, mm-hmm. you know, start call As soon as you get a puppy, you know, start calling around, interviewing groomers. You know, inter- interview your groomer. We interview our clients, you know, ask them questions, um, you know, find out what they like doing, you know, what they do a lot of, what – you know, that kind of thing. Cool. Yeah. Well, and thanks. hire a trainer. Yeah. <laughs> trainer. We, cool. We're very thankful for dogs that go to training. Yeah, I'm sure that helps. It does. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks for coming on. Yeah, it's thanks for great. having me. Yeah. It's cool. been awesome. <laughs>